The Castle of Adventure by Enid Blyton Two girls sat on a window seat in their school study. One had red wavy hair and so many freckles that it was impossible to count them. The other had dark hair that stuck up in front in an amusing tuft. One more day and then the halls begin, said red-haired Lucy Ann, looking at Dinah out of curious green eyes. I'm longing to see Jack again. A whole term is an awfully long time to be away from him. <laughs> well, I don't mind being away from my brother, said Dinah with a laugh. Philip's not bad, but he does make me wild, always bringing in those awful animals and insects of his. It's a good thing there's only one day between our breaking up days, said Lucy Ann. I wonder what this place is like that Mother's taken for the halls, said Dinah. I'll get out her letter and read it again. She fished in her pocket for the letter. Lucy Ann took it and read it with interest. Yes, it's a place called Spring Cottage, and it's on the side of Castle Hill. She says it's a rather lonely sort of place, but packed with wild birds, so Jack will be very pleased. I can't understand your brother being so mad on birds, said Dinah. He's just as bad about birds as Philip is about insects and animals. Philip's marvellous with animals, I think, said Lucy Ann, who had a great admiration for Dinah's brother. I wonder how Kiki has got on this term, said Dinah. Kiki was Jack's parrot, an extremely clever bird who could imitate voices and sounds in a most remarkable manner. Kiki wasn't going to be allowed to be at school with Jack this term, said Lucy Ann sadly. It's an awful pity, but still, he got a friend in the town to look after her for him, and he goes to see her every day, but I do think they might have let him have her at school. Well, considering that Kiki kept telling the headmaster not to sniff, and Jack's form master to wipe his feet, I'm not surprised they didn't want Kiki this term, said Dinah. The girls were glad that the holidays were so soon coming. They and the two boys and Kiki would have good fun together. Lucy Ann especially looked forward to being with Dinah's pretty, merry mother. Jack and Lucy Ann Trent had no father or mother, and had lived with a cross old uncle for years, until by chance they had met Philip and Dinah Mannering. These two had no father, but they had a mother who had offered to have their great friends Jack and Lucy Ann as well. So, in turn time, the two girls went to school together, and the two boys were at another school. And in the holidays, all four joined up with Mrs Mannering, the mother of Philip and Dinah. Now, in the coming holidays, they were all to be together in this holiday cottage that Mrs. Mannering had found. Oh, I wish the holes would come quickly, said Lucy Ann, getting off the window seat restlessly. I don't know why these last two or three days always drag so. But tomorrow came, and the two girls went off in the train with scores of their friends chattering and laughing. At last, they were at the station for their holiday home. They leapt out, and Dinah found the one and only porter. He went to get their luggage. There's mother, shouted Dinah, and rushed to her pretty, bright-eyed mother, who'd come to meet them. Dinah was not one to hug or kiss very much, but Lucy Ann made up for that. Dinah gave her mother one quick peck of a kiss, but Lucy Ann gave her a bear hug and rubbed her red head happily against Mrs. Mannering's chin. Oh, it's lovely to see you again, she said thinking for the hundredth time how lucky Dinah was to have a mother of her own. "'I've got the car outside to meet you,' said Mrs. Mannering. "'Come along. The porter will bring your luggage.' They got into the little car, and the porter put the trunks in at the back. Mrs. Mannering took the wheel. "'It's quite a long way to Spring Cottage,' she said. "'We have to fetch our own goods and food from the village here, except for eggs and butter and milk, which a nearby farm lets me have. But it's lovely country. As for birds, well, <laughs> Jack will have the time of his life. "'It's nesting time, too. He'll be thinking of nothing but eggs and nests,' said Lucy Ann. The girls looked round them as Mrs. Mannering drove along. It certainly was lovely country. It was very hilly, and in the distance the hills looked blue and rather exciting.' Lucy Ann gave a shout. I say, look at that castle on top of the hill. Just look at it. Dinah looked. It certainly was a most imposing and rugged old castle. It had a tower at each end, and its walls looked thick. It had slit windows, but it had wide ones, too, which looked a little odd. Is it a really old castle? asked Lucy Ann. No, not really, said Mrs. Mannering. Some of it's old, but most of it has been restored and rebuilt, so that it's a real mix-up. 
Nobody lives there now. It's shut up and hasn't a very good name. Why? Did something horrid happen there once? asked Dinah. I think so, said her mother. But I really don't know anything about it. You better not go up there anyway, because the road up to it has had a landslide or something and is very dangerous. They say that part of the castle is ready to slip down the hill. Oh, I hope it won't slip onto our cottage, said Lucy Ann, half scared. Mrs. Mannering laughed. Of course not. Look, there's our cottage, tucked away amongst those trees. It was a lovely little cottage, with a thatched roof and small leaded windows. The girls loved it the minute they saw it. Oh, mother, we shall have a lovely time here. Won't the boys be thrilled? said Dinah. That day and the morning of the next, the two girls spent in exploring their holiday home. Spring Cottage, said Dinah. It's a nice name for it, especially in the springtime. It's named because of the spring that runs down behind it, said her mother. The water starts somewhere up in the yard of the castle, I believe, runs down through a tunnel it's made for itself, and gushes out just above the cottage at the back. It runs through the garden, then, and disappears down the hillside. The girls explored the spring. They found where it gushed out, and Dinah tasted the water. It was cold and crystal clear. She liked hearing the gurgling sound it made in the untidy little garden. She heard it all night long in her sleep and loved it. Next day they went to the station to pick up the boys. Both the boys were hanging out of the window, waving and shouting, and the girls screamed greetings and capered about in delight. There's Kiki! shouted Lucy Ann. Kiki! Good old Kiki! With a screech, Kiki flew off Jack's shoulder and landed on Lucy Ann's. She rubbed her beak against the little girl's cheek and made a curious cracking noise. The boys jumped out of the carriage. Jack rushed to Lucy Ann and gave her a hug, which the little girl returned, her eyes shining. Kiki gave another screech and flew back onto Jack's shoulder. Wipe your feet, she said sternly to the startled porter. And where's your handkerchief? Philip grinned at his sister Dinah. Hello, old thing, he said. You've grown. Good thing I have too, or you'd be as tall as I am. Hello, Lucy Ann. You haven't grown. Been a good girl at school? Don't talk like a grown-up, said Dinah. Mother's outside in the car. Come and see her. The porter took their trunks on his barrow and followed the four excited children. Kiki flew down to the barrow and looked at him with bright eyes. Attention, please, said Kiki sternly. Open your books at page six. Everyone laughed. She got that from one of the masters, said Jack. Oh, Aunt Ally, she was so funny in the train. She put her head out of the window at every station and said, Right away there, just as she'd heard a guard say, and you should have seen the engine driver's face. Jack and Lucy Ann called Mrs. Mannering Aunt Ally, because Mrs. Mannering seemed too stiff and standoffish. She liked both children very much, but especially Lucy Ann, who was far more gentle and affectionate than Dinah had ever been. I say, this looks exciting country, said Philip, looking out of the car windows. Plenty of birds here for you, Freckles, and plenty of animals for me. Where's that brown rat you had this term, said Jack, with a mischievous glance at Dinah. She gave a squeal at once. Philip began to feel about in his pockets, diving into first one and then the other, whilst Dinah watched him in horror, expecting to see a brown rat appear at any moment. Mother, stop the car, let me walk, begged Dinah. Philip's got a rat somewhere on him. Her mother stopped the car. Dinah fumbled at the door handle. No, you stay in, Dinah, said her mother. Philip, you get out, and the rat too. <laughs> well, mother, as a matter of fact, I left the rat behind at school, said Philip with a grin. I was just teasing Dinah, that's all. Beast, said Dinah. I thought you were, said his mother, driving on again. Well, you nearly had to walk home, so just be careful. Now, what do you think of Spring Cottage? The boys liked it just as much as the girls did, but it was the strange old castle that really took their fancy. Dinah forgot to sulk as she pointed it out to the boys. We'll go up there, said Jack, at once. Uh, I think not, said Mrs. Mannering. I've just explained to the girls that it's dangerous up there. Oh, but why? asked Jack, disappointed. Well, there's been a landslide on the road and no one dares to set foot on it now, said Mrs. Mannering. I did hear that the whole castle is slipping a bit and might collapse if the road crumbles much more. Sounds very exciting, said Philip, his eyes gleaming. 
The first day or two were very happy days indeed. The four children and Kiki wandered about as they pleased, and Jack found so many nests that he marvelled to see them. He got very excited one day because he said he saw an eagle. An eagle? said Dinah, disbelievingly. Golly, I wonder if it's nesting anywhere near here, said Jack. Well, I'm not going eagle nesting, said Dinah, firmly. Anyway, Jack, you've found about a hundred nests already. Surely that's enough for you without wanting to see an eagle's nest as well. Kiki always came with them on their excursion, sitting on Jack's shoulder. We're not likely to have any adventures here, said Philip. It's all so quiet and peaceful. The village folk have hardly a word to say, have they? They say, ah, that's right to everything. They're amazed by Kiki, said Dinah. Oh, ah, that's right, said Jack, imitating the speech of the villagers. Kiki immediately did the same. I wish we could go up and explore that strange castle, said Dinah longingly, looking up to where it towered on the summit of the hill. Mother says something horrid once happened there, but she doesn't know what. We'll try and find out, said Jack promptly. I expect people were killed there or something. Ooh, how horrid. I don't want to go up there, said Lucy Ann at once. Well, Mother said we weren't to anyhow, said Dinah. She might let us go eagle nesting, said Philip, and if our search took us near the castle, we couldn't very well help it, could we? We'd better tell her if we do go anywhere near, said Jack. I'll ask her if she minds. So he asked her that evening. Aunt Ally, I believe there may be an eagle's nest somewhere on the top of this hill, he said. You wouldn't mind if I tried to find the nest, would you? No. Not if you're careful, said Mrs. Mannering. But would your hunt take you anywhere near the old castle? Well, it might. But you can trust us not to fool about on any landslides, Aunt Allie. We'll be very careful, promised Jack, delighted that Mrs. Mannering hadn't forbidden outright their going up the hill to the castle. He told the others, and they were thrilled. We'll go up tomorrow, shall we? said Jack. I really do want to hunt about to see if there's any sign of an eagle's nest. That afternoon... In their wandering, they had a curious feeling of being followed. Once or twice, Jack turned round, sure that someone was behind them. But there was never anyone there. It's funny, he said to Philip in a low voice. I felt certain there was someone behind us then. I heard the crack of a twig. Yes, I thought so too, said Philip. I tell you what, Jack. When we get into that patch of trees, I'll crouch down behind a bush and stop while you others go on. The girls were told what Philip was going to do. When he came to a conveniently thick bush, Philip dropped down suddenly behind it and hid, while the others walked on, talking loudly. Philip lay there and listened. He could hear nothing at first. Then he heard a rustle, and his heart beat fast. Who was it tracking them, and why? Someone came up to his bush. Someone crept past without seeing him. Philip gazed at the someone and was so astonished that he let out an exclamation. Well! A girl with ragged clothes, bare feet and wild curling hair jumped violently and turned round. In a trice, Philip had jumped up and had hold of her wrists. She tried to bite him and kicked out with her bare feet. Now don't be silly, said Philip. I'll let you go when you tell me why you're following us. The others, hearing Philip's voice, came running back. This is the person who was following us, but I can't get a word out of her, said Philip. She's a wild girl, said Dinah. The girl scowled at her, and then she glanced at Kiki on Jack's shoulder and stared as if she couldn't take her eyes off her. I believe she was only following us to get a glimpse of the parrot, said Philip with a laugh. Is that right, wild girl? The girl nodded. Ah, that's right, she said. Ah, that's right, said Kiki. The girl stared and gave a laugh of surprise. What's your name? asked Philip, letting go of her wrists. Tassie, said the girl. I saw that bird and I came after you. I didn't mean no harm. I live round the hill with my mother. I know where you live. I know all you do. Oh, you've been spying round a bit and following us, I suppose, said Jack. Do you know this hillside well? Tassie nodded. Her bright black eyes hardly left Kiki. She seemed fascinated by the parrot. Pop! Go, 
Mr. Weasel, said Kiki to her in a solemn voice. Open your book at page six. I say, do you know if the eagles nest on this hill? asked Jack suddenly. What's an eagle? said Tassie. A big bird, said Jack. A very big bird with a curved beak and... Like your bird there, said Tassie, pointing to Kiki. Oh, no, said Jack. Well, never mind. If you don't know what an eagle is like, then you won't know where it nests either. It's time to go back home, said Philip. I'm hungry. Tassie, take us the shortest way home. To Philip's surprise, Tassie turned round and plunged down the hillside as sure-footed as a goat. The others followed. She took them such a short cut that all of them were amazed when they saw Spring Cottage in front of them. Thanks, Tassie, said Philip, and Kiki echoed his words. Thanks, Tassie. Tassie smiled, and her usual rather sulky look fled. I'll see you again, she said, and ran off. Golly! I wish I could get a baby fox, a little cub, said Philip a day or two later. I've always wanted one. They're like small and lively puppies, you know. Tassie was with them when he said this. She often joined up with them now and was quite invaluable because she always knew the way home. It seemed very easy to get lost on the vast hill, but Tassie could always show them a shortcut. She was an odd girl. She never wore anything but a ragged frock that looked as if it had been made from a dirty sack. Her wild, curly hair was in a tangle, and she was always barefoot. I don't mind her being barefoot, but she's rather dirty, said Lucy Ann to Dinah. I don't believe she ever has a bath. On inquiry, it was found that Tassie didn't know what a bath was. Dinah took her into Spring Cottage and showed her the big tin bath they all used. Her mother was there and looked at the wild girl in amazement. Whoever is that dirty little girl? she asked Lucy Ann in a low voice. She'd better have a bath. But when Dinah explained to Tassie what having a bath meant, Tassie looked scared. She shrank back in horror at the thought of sitting down in water. Now you listen to me, said Mrs. Mannering firmly. If you like to let me give you a bath and scrub you well, I'll find a cotton frock of Dinah's for you and a ribbon for your hair. The thought of this finery thrilled Tassie to such an extent that she consented to have a bath. So she was shut up in the kitchen with Dinah's mother, a bath of hot water and plenty of soap. In half an hour's time, Tassie came out of the kitchen looking quite different. Her hair was washed and brushed and tied back with a blue ribbon. She wore a blue cotton frock of Dinah's and on her feet she actually had a pair of old rubber shoes. Oh, Tassie, you look fine, said Lucy Ann and Tassie looked pleased. I smell nice, she said, evidently liking the smell of carbolic soap better than the others did. But that bath was dreadful. How often do you have a bath? Once a year? Tassie was extraordinary. She attached herself to Philip and also to Kiki, and plainly thought that he and the parrot were the most admirable members of the party. The day after her bath, she came down to the cottage and looked in at the window. She held something in her arms, and the others wondered what it was. There's Tassie, said Lucy Ann. She's got her blue frock on, but her hair's all in a tangle again. What has she got in her arms? said Dinah curiously. Tassie, come in and show us what you've got. Tassie went round to the back door. She appeared in the kitchen, and Philip gave a yell. It's a fox cub! Oh, the pretty little thing! Tassie, where did you get it? From its den, said Tassie. I knew where a fox family lived, you see. Philip took the little cub in his arms. It was the prettiest thing imaginable, with its sharp little nose, its small brushed tail, and its thick red coat. It lay quivering in Philip's arms, looking up at him. Before many seconds had passed, the spell that Philip seemed to put on all animals fell upon the fox cub. It crept up to his neck, and licked him. It cuddled against him. It showed him, in every way it could, that it loved him. You've got a wonderful way with animals, said his mother. You'll have to keep it in some sort of cage, won't you, or it'll run off. Of course not, mother, said Philip scornfully. I shall train it to run to heel like a puppy. It'll soon learn. Well, 
"'But foxes are such wild creatures,' said his mother doubtfully. "'But no creature was wild with Philip. "'Before two hours had gone by, "'the cub was scampering at Philip's heels, "'begging to be taken into his arms whenever the boy stopped. "'Kiki disliked Philip's fox cub very much "'and scolded it vigorously whenever she saw it. "'But Tassie she loved and flew to her shoulder as soon as she saw her, murmuring nonsense into her ear. "'I wish Kiki would leave Button alone,' said Philip. Button was the name he'd given to the little fox cub, which, like Tassie, followed him about whenever it could. "'Kiki is really behaving badly about Button. I suppose she's jealous.' "'How many times have I told you to wipe your feet?' Kiki demanded of Button. "'Where's your handkerchief?' "'Shut up, Kiki, you remind me of school,' said Jack. "'I say, you others, I saw that eagle again today. "'It was soaring over the hilltop. "'I'm sure it's got a nest up there.' "'Well, let's go up and find it,' said Dinah. "'I'm longing to have a squint at that old castle anyway.' "'So, on the following afternoon, they set off up the winding roadway, "'narrow and steep, just wide enough to take a cart.' "'Tassie soon appeared from somewhere, still wearing the cotton frock, "'though it was now torn and dirty. "'She had the rubber shoes tied around her waist. "'It amused the children that she always brought them with her, "'although she never wore them. "'Tassie attached herself to Philip and Button. "'Kiki addressed a few amiable remarks to her, "'and then flew off over the rookery "'to startle the rooks with her realistic coings. The children went on up the road. It was very hot that afternoon, and they panted and puffed as they climbed. Why did we choose an afternoon like this to go up to the castle? said Philip. Tassie stopped. To the castle? she said. You can't go this way. The road up above is blocked. You can only get round the back now. Well, we want to see what there is to be seen, said Philip. "'I'd like to go right into the castle,' said Jack. "'No, no,' said Tassie, her eyes widening as if she was scared. "'Why not?' asked Jack. "'It's empty, isn't it?' "'No, it's not empty,' said Tassie. "'There are voices and, and cryings and the sound of feet. It, "'It's not a good place to go.' "'What's the old story about the castle?' asked Dinah. "'Do you know it, Tassie?' <laughs> It is said that a wicked man lived there once who got people to visit him in his castle and they were never heard of again, said Tassie, speaking in a low voice as if she was afraid that the wicked man, whoever he was, might hear her. <laughs> what a nice old man, said Philip with a laugh. I don't believe a word of it. I'd love to explore all over the castle, wouldn't you, Jack? Rather, said Jack. Kiki, get off my shoulder for a bit. You feel jolly heavy up this hill. Kiki, I love you, said Tassie and Kiki flew to her at once. Tassie didn't pant and puff as the others did. She was like a goat, the way she sprang up the steepest places and never seemed in the least tired. Hello. We're a good way up at last, said Philip, wiping his hot forehead. Look, the road goes all strange here. So it did. It could no longer be called a road, for part of the hillside had fallen away and had piled itself on the road and all around. Enormous boulders of rock lay where they'd rolled, and the stumps of trees showed where the moving hillside had cut them into pieces. The children gazed over the untidy, rock-strewn landscape. It looks as if an earthquake had upset it, said Lucy Ann. Beyond the landslide stood the castle, looking even more enormous now. The children could see two of the square towers with the long, battlemented wall stretching between them. I'd like to go up into one of those towers. Tassie, how do we get to the back of it? asked Philip, turning to the little girl. We could climb over this landslide bit, I suppose, but we said we wouldn't. There's my eagle again! cried Jack, suddenly in excitement, and he pointed to a big bird that rose soaring in the air above the castle. See? You see it? It is an eagle, no doubt about it. Isn't it enormous? I bet it's got a nest somewhere about. Oh, golly, there's another of them. Look, two eagles and together. Well, that settles it. There must be a nest. You're not thinking of taming a young eagle, I hope, said Dinah in alarm. <laughs> Don't worry, Kiki would never let Jack have a tame eagle, said Lucy Ann. This was true, and Dinah heaved a sigh of relief. They rose from somewhere behind the castle, as far as I could see, said Jack eagerly. Let's go round and see if we can find out where their nest is. Come on, we'll see where they fly down to. Oh, I wish I'd brought my camera. I could have photographed the nest. 
They were near to the castle by now. The great thick walls rose up far above their heads. There was no break in them, except about sixteen feet up, where slit windows could be seen. There are the eagles again, cried Jack. They've gone down inside the castle courtyard. That's where they've got their nest, I bet. In the courtyard somewhere. I simply must find it. But you can't possibly get into the courtyard, said Philip. Where's the gateway of the castle? demanded Jack, turning to Tassie. At the front, where that landslide is, said Tassie. You couldn't get over the landslide without being in danger in any way. If you did, you'd find the great gate shut. There's another door further along here, but that's locked. You can't get into the castle. Where's the door along here, said Jack. They went further along, turned a corner of the castle wall, and came to a sturdy oak door flush with the wall. The wall arched over it, and the door fitted exactly. Jack put his eye to the keyhole, but could see nothing. Do you mean to tell me there's no other way into this castle? he said to Tassie. She considered solemnly. Then she nodded her head. I might know. I've never been, but it might be a way. Show us quickly, said Jack eagerly. Tassie led them further round the castle towards the back of it. Here it was built almost into the cliff. A narrow, dark pathway led between the steep hillside and the back wall of the castle. Tassie came to a stop and pointed up. The other four looked and saw that there was one of the slit windows high up above them. They stared at Tassie, not seeing in the least how that helped them. Don't you see? said Tassie. You could climb up the cliff side here because it's all overgrown with creepers and then when you get opposite that window you might put a branch of a tree across or something and get in. I see what she means, said Philip. If we could lug a plank up the side of the steep cliff here that the castle backs onto and put one end of it onto the window sill and the other firmly into the cliff, we could slide across and get in. It's an idea. The rest of the company received this news with mixed feelings. Put out the light, said Kiki earnestly from somewhere in the dark passage. Put out the light. The children laughed. It was funny the way Kiki sometimes said what sounded like a very sensible sentence. Let's find a branch or something, said Jack. So they hunted for something to use as a bridge across to the window of the castle, but there was nothing to be found at all. True, Philip found a dead branch, but it was so dead that it would have cracked at once under anyone's weight. Oh, blow, said Jack. Anyway, we know what to do. We'll find a plank or something to bring up here tomorrow, and we'll send Tassie up with it, and she can put it across from the cliffside to the window. We'll give her a strong rope, too, so that she can knot it to some of that creeper up there, and we can pull on it to help ourselves up. We're not as goat-footed as Tassie. No, she's marvellous, said Lucy Ann, and Tassie glowed with pleasure. They made their way down the hillside again, finding it a little easier to climb down than up, especially as Tassie took them a good way that she knew. It's really getting very late, said Jack. I hope your mother won't be anxious, Philip. Oh, no, said Philip. She'd know one of us would run down for help if anything happened. All the same, Mrs. Mannering had been wondering what had become of the children, and she was very glad to see them. Next morning, the five children set off soon after breakfast. Diana carried the knapsack of food, Lucy Ann carried Jack's precious camera, Tassie carried Kiki on her shoulder, very proudly indeed, and the two boys carried between them a plank they'd found in the garage. Take us the shortest way you know, Tassie, begged Jack. This plank is so awkward to carry. I say, Philip, did you think to bring a rope too? I forgot. I've tied one round my waist, said Philip. It's long enough, I think. Oh, button! Don't get under my feet like that, and don't ask to be carried when I've got to take this tiresome plank up the hill. With many rests, the little party went up the steep hill towards the castle. At last, they arrived and made their way around the great wall to the back, where the wall of the castle ran level with the side of the hill. Tassie, you go up first and tie this rope firmly to a stout creeper stem, said Philip, giving her the rope which he'd untied from his waist. Then we can all pull ourselves up by it without slipping. Tassie climbed up the creeper-clad wall easily. She stopped opposite the slit window of the castle. She tied the rope firmly round a strong creeper stem and then slid down, holding the rope, and landed beside them on her toes. You ought to be in a circus, said Jack. 
Philip had another shorter piece of rope. That's to haul the plank up with, he said. Now, tie the plank to my waist, he said to Jack. Then I can have both hands to help myself up with, and the plank will come up behind me by itself. His feet slipped, but he went on upwards, feeling the drag of the heavy plank on his waist. At last he was opposite the castle window. Look out! I'm coming up too to help, called Jack from below. And up he came, pulling on Tassie's rope. Then between them they managed to haul up the plank and lift it so that it almost reached the window sill. A bit more over, that's right. Now a bit more to the right, panted Jack. And then, with a thud, the plank at last rested on the sill of the narrow slit window. The other end rested firmly on a mass of tangled creeper roots and on some stout ivy stems. Have you really fixed it? shouted Dinah in excitement. Jolly good! Oh, look out! There goes Kiki! Sure enough, Kiki, who had been watching everything in the greatest surprise, had sailed up in the air and was now sitting on the plank. Then she walked clumsily across to the window and hopped on the sill. She poked her beak inside the opening. Kiki always likes to poke her nose into everything, said Lucy Ann. Can we come up now, Philip? I'll go across the plank, said Jack. But a shout from Lucy Ann stopped him. No, Jack, wait till I'm up there. I want to see you properly. I can only see your legs from down here. Soon all three girls were up by the boys. It was easy to go up by the rope. They watched Jack sit astride the plank and gradually edge himself across. He got to the window sill. He stood up on the plank and clutched the stone sides of the narrow window. He stood in the opening. Golly, it's narrow, he shouted across the plank to where the others were watching him breathlessly. He wriggled through gradually and then suddenly jumped to the floor the other side. He yelled back, Hurrah! I'm through! Come on, everyone! I'm in a pitch-black room! We'll have to bring torches next time! Dinah went next, helped by Philip. Jack helped her down the other side. Then came Tassie, then Lucy Ann, then Philip, who had as much difficulty as Jack in squeezing through. Well, here we are, he said, inside the Castle of Adventure. The Castle of Adventure? echoed Lucy Ann in surprise. What makes you say that? Do you think we shall have an adventure here? Oh, I don't know, said Philip. I just said it. <laughs> but it's got an odd feeling, this castle, hasn't it? My word, isn't it dark? A mournful barking came from below. It was Button, left behind. Philip stuck his head out of the window. It's all right, Button. We're coming back. Kiki stuck her head out, too, and gave a railway engine screech. That's just to tell poor Button she's up here, and he's not, said Dinah. Kiki, you do like to crow over poor Button, don't you? It was very dark in the room they'd jumped into, but gradually they could see better as their eyes got used to the darkness. It's just a big bare room, said Jack, rather disappointed. Come on, let's do a bit of exploring. They made their way to the door, which opened into a long corridor. They went down this and came to a lighter room, lit by one slit window and one wide one, evidently added much later. They went into the next room, which again was very dark, because it had only a slit window to light it. Dinah wandered to the window and suddenly gave such a yell that everyone jumped violently. Dinah! What is it? cried Philip. There's something in this room, she cried. It touched my hair. I felt it. Come out quickly. Don't be silly, began Philip. And then he stopped suddenly. Something had touched his hair too. Then a ray of sunlight unexpectedly came slanting in through the slit window, and Philip gave a sudden laugh. <laughs> How silly we are, he said. It's cobwebs. Look, hanging down from the ceiling. They must be years old. Everyone was very much relieved, but Dinah wouldn't stay in the room one moment more. Come out where it's sunshiny, she begged. And they all went into a wide corridor where the sun poured in at many windows. Look, this way leads across one of the battlemented walls to the tower, cried Jack. Let's go along to the tower. We'll get a magnificent view from there. 
I feel like an old-time soldier marching round the castle wall, said Philip, as they made their way along to the tower. Here we are. Oh, look, there's a winding stone stair that leads to the top of the tower. Come on, up we go. And up they went. The stone stair twisted awkwardly round and round and led them straight into another room, out of which a narrow stair led them to the very roof of the tower itself. They went up the tiny stair and found themselves on the top of the tower, its battlemented edge rising a few feet all round. They all gasped and gazed down in silence. Not one of them had ever been so high up before, nor had they seen such a wide and magnificent view. What a wonderful place this must have been for a lookout, said Philip. Any sentry here could see enemies coming miles and miles away. Look, is that spring cottage right down there among those trees? It was, looking like a doll's house halfway down the hill. I wish we could bring Mother up here, said Dinah. How she'd love this view. Look, look, there are the eagles again, said Jack and he pointed up in the air where two great eagles soared to the clouds. I say, shall we have our lunch here, on top of this tower, and see this marvellous view all the time, and watch my eagles? Oh, yes, said everyone, including Kiki. She always joined in any chorus. Poor little button, said Philip. I wish we could have brought him too, but it was too risky across that plank. I expect he's feeling very lonely now. I hope he won't run off. Dinah divided out sandwiches, cake, biscuits, fruit, and chocolate. Then she presented everyone with a cardboard cup of lemonade from a bottle. We've had plenty of picnics in our time, said Philip, biting hugely into a thick sandwich of egg and ham, but never one in such an extraordinary place as this. It almost makes me giddy, looking out at that enormous view. Jack had been watching the eagles, which all the time they were at lunch had been soaring high in the air, looking like black specks. Now they were coming down again, gliding in large circles, their great wings spread out to catch the smallest current of air. They watched the eagles go lower and lower. Below them and behind them lay the inner courtyard of the castle. It was overgrown with grass and patches of heather. Gorse bushes grew there and a few small birch trees. I believe the eagles have their nest in that clump of trees over there in the corner of the courtyard, said Jack excitedly. Shall we go and see? Are you sure they're not dangerous, said Philip doubtfully. They're awfully big birds, and I have heard stories of them attacking men. Yes, said Jack. Well, as soon as they fly off again, I'll go and look. Anyway, we might as well go down now and have a look round. Kiki, come here. Kiki flew to his shoulder and nibbled his ear gently, talking her usual nonsense. The children got up and went down the two stone stairways. How do we get down to the courtyard? wondered Philip. We'll have to go back along the wall and into the castle itself, I suppose. There must be a stairway down to the rooms below. So back they went and came to the main building of the castle again. They looked into room after room, all empty. Then at last they came to a very wide stone stairway that led down and down. They clattered down it and came into a big hall. It was dark. Something suddenly hurled itself against Philip's legs, and he leapt in fright, giving a loud exclamation. What is it? said Lucy Ann in a whisper. It was Button, the fox cub. Now how in the world did he get to us? cried Philip, picking the little creature up. He must have found some hole, I suppose, and scrambled through it to find us. Button, you're a marvel. But my word, you did give me a fright. Now let's get into the courtyard and explore around a bit, said Jack. Look out for the eagles, all of you. The children picked their way over the big, overgrown courtyard towards a towering piece of rock, clothed here and there with heather, that rose up at one end of the courtyard. You girls stay down at the bottom of this crag, said Jack. I'm going to climb up with Philip. The boys were just beginning to climb when a loud yelping scream made them stop and clutch at one another in fright. The girls jumped violently. Button ran into the nearest rabbit hole and stayed there. Only Kiki seemed not to be frightened. What was it, Jack? whispered Lucy Ann. Come back. Don't go up there. The scream came from there. 
It came again, more loudly, a curious, almost yelping noise. Kiki cleared her throat to imitate it. She gave a remarkably good imitation of the scream and made everyone jump again. Bad bird, naughty bird, said Jack fiercely in a low voice. Kiki looked at him. From her throat came the scream again, and, almost at the same moment, a great eagle, which must have been somewhere on the rocky crag, rose up in the air on enormous wings and soared over the little company, looking down in amazement to see who had made such a noise. And then, from the eagle's own throat, there came again the yelping scream the children had heard. Gosh! It was the eagle screaming, that's all, said Jack in relief. I've never heard one before. That shows their nest must be somewhere up there. Come on, Philip. The eagle didn't swoop down to the children, but glided above them, looking down. Its interest was centred on Kiki, who, feeling rather thrilled at having found such a good new noise, yelped again. The eagle answered and flew lower. Kiki went up to meet it, looking very small compared with the big eagle. It is a golden eagle, said Lucy Ann. Jack was right. Look at those golden feathers. Oh dear, I hope it doesn't come any lower. All the five children watched Kiki and the eagle. Usually, birds were either puzzled and afraid of Kiki, or angry. But the eagle was neither. It seemed intensely interested, as if wondering how it was that this queer-looking little bird, so unlike an eagle, could make eagle noises. Finally, it flew upwards to a high rock on the crag and perched there, looking down in a very royal fashion. Isn't it a magnificent bird, said Jack in the utmost delight. Fancy us seeing an eagle at close quarters like this. There's the second eagle. Look, said Lucy Ann suddenly in a low voice. The children saw the other eagle rising up into the air from the crag, evidently curious to see what was happening. It soared upwards, spreading out its strong pinions like fingers, its wingtips curving up as it went. And then, quite suddenly... The first eagle, tired of Kiki, flapped its enormous wings and joined its mate. You ought to have snapped that eagle sitting on the crag, said Philip. Jack gave an exclamation of annoyance. Oh, blow! I never even thought of my camera. I was so absorbed in watching the birds. What marvellous pictures I could take. The two birds were now only specks in the sky, for they'd soared up to an immense height. It'd be a jolly good chance to explore this crag for their nest while they're safely up there, said Jack. The boys began to climb up again. It was fairly stiff going, for the little crag was steep and rocky. Its top was almost as high as the nearby tower. On the western side, well hidden in a little hollow, Jack found what he wanted. The eagle's nest. Look, he said, look! Did you ever see such an enormous thing, Philip? It must be six feet wide at the bottom. The boys looked at the great nest on the broad ledge of rock. It was about two feet high, made of twigs and small boughs with heather tucked in between. There's a young one in the nest, said Jack in delight. Quite a big bird, too. Must be more than three months old and ready to fly. The young bird crouched down in the nest when it heard Jack's voice. It was already so big that Philip would hardly have known it was a nestling. But Jack's sure eye had noticed the white bases of the feathers, telling him that this was a young eagle and not an old one. Kiki flew inquisitively to the nest. She gave a yelp like the eagle had made. The young bird looked up inquiringly, recognised the sound, but not the maker of it. Your camera, quick, whispered Philip and Jack began to adjust his camera with quick, eager fingers. Quick! The old eagles are coming back, whispered Philip. And Jack gave a glance upwards. The eagles had remembered their young one, and seeing the boys so near the nest were coming down to see what was happening. Jack snapped the camera just in time, for Kiki flew off almost immediately to meet the eagles, screaming a welcome. We'd better get down now, said Philip. 
thinking that the two old eagles look pretty fierce. My word, I wish we could take pictures of the young one learning to fly. It looks as if it'll take off from the nest any day now. With the two eagles gliding not far above them, the boys climbed down as hastily as they could. Did you get a snap? asked Lucy Ann eagerly, and Jack nodded. He looked excited. I shall have to come back again, he said. Do you know, I might get finer close-up pictures of eagles than anyone has ever got before. Think of that. I'd make a lot of money out of them, I dare say, and I'd have them in all kind of nature magazines. Oh, Jack, do take some more pictures then, said Lucy Ann, her eyes shining. I'd have to almost live up there to take good ones, said Jack. It's no good just coming up on the off chance. If only I could spend a few days here, I could make a hide, you know, and... What's a hide? asked Tassie, speaking for almost the first time that morning. A hide? Oh, it's, it's a place I should rig up to hide myself and my camera in, said Jack. I might take a whole set of pictures showing the young eagle learning to fly. Well, ask Mother if you can come up then, said Philip. You'll have Kiki for company, and we'll come up and see you every day. Come on now, let's explore the lower parts of the castle a bit more. So they made their way back across the yard into the lower parts of the great building, expecting to see the same vast empty rooms there as they'd seen above. But what a surprise they got. They went into a great doorway and walked across the dark hall, which echoed strangely with their footsteps. From outside came the yelping scream of the eagles again. I expect it was the screams of the eagles that the villagers heard year after year up here, said Jack as he made his way to a stout door that led off the hall. He opened it, and then stood still in surprise. This room was furnished. It had once been a kind of sitting room or drawing room, and the mouldy old furniture was still there. Dinah shivered. When the others went further into the room, walking on tiptoe and talking in whispers, she did not follow. Lucy Ann patted a chair, and at once a cloud of dust arose, making her choke. Philip pulled at a cover on one of the sofas, and it fell to pieces in his hands. It was quite rotten. They went out and into the next one. That was quite empty, but the third one, smaller, and evidently used as a dining room, was again furnished. And again the spider's webs stretched everywhere, and hung down in long grey threads from the high ceilings. Curiouser and curiouser, said Lucy Ann, quoting Alice in Wonderland. Why have these rooms been left like this? I expect the wicked old man Tassie told us about just lived in a few rooms, and these were the ones, said Jack. Maybe he went away, meaning to come back, and never did. And nobody dared to come here, or perhaps nobody even knew that the rooms had been left furnished. It's a mystery. The little fox cub went sniffing all round the rooms, raising clouds of dust and choking now and again. Kiki didn't seem to like the rooms. She stayed on Jack's shoulder, quite silent. They came to the kitchen. This was a simply enormous place with a great cooking range at the back. Iron saucepans and an iron kettle were still there. Philip tried to lift one, but it was immensely heavy. <laughs> Cooks must have had very strong arms in the old days, he said. Look! Is that a pump by the old sink? I suppose they had to pump their water up. They crossed over to the sink. The old-fashioned pump had a handle, which had to be worked up and down in order to bring water from some deep-down well. Philip stared at it in a puzzled manner, his eyes going to a puddle on the floor just below the pump. What's the matter, Philip? said Jack. Nothing much, but where did that water come from? said Philip. See? It's in a puddle. It can only have been there a day or two, or it would have dried up. Jack, too, felt puzzled. Let's pump a bit and see if water comes up, he said, and stretched out his hand. Before he could reach the handle, Philip knocked his hand aside with an exclamation. Jack looked at him in surprise. See here, said Philip, the handle of the pump isn't covered with dust like everything else is. It's rubbed clean just where you'd take hold of it to pump. Dinah felt a little prickle of fright go down her back. Whatever did Philip mean? Who could pump up water in an old empty castle? 
They all stared at the pump handle and saw that Philip was right. Button began to lap up the puddle of water on the stone floor. Wait, Button, I'll pump you some fresh water, said Philip, and he took hold of the pump handle. He worked it up and down vigorously, and fresh, clear water poured in gushes into the huge old sink. Some of it splashed out into the puddle already on the floor. That's how the puddle was made, said Jack, watching carefully. But that means someone must have pumped up water here in the last few days. Tassie's eyes grew big with fright. The wicked old man's still here, she said and she looked fearfully over her shoulder, as if she expected him to walk into the kitchen. "'Don't be so silly, Tassie,' said Philip impatiently. "'The old man's dead and gone years and years ago. "'Do you know if any of the villagers ever come up here?' "'No, oh no,' said Tassie. "'They're afraid of the castle. They say it's a bad place.' The five children certainly felt it had a strange, brooding air about it. They felt that they wanted to go out into the sunshine. Kiki suddenly gave a mournful groan that made them all jump. Don't, Kiki, said Jack crossly. Philip, what do you make of this? Who's been pumping up the water? Can there be anyone in the castle now? Well, we haven't seen signs of anyone at all, said Philip. And why should anyone be here anyway? There's nothing for them to live on. No food or anything. I think myself that probably some rambler came up here in curiosity, wandered about, got himself a drink of water from the pump before he went. This seemed the most likely explanation. But how did he get in? said Dinah, after a moment or two. Well, there must be some way, said Jack. There isn't, said Tassie. I've been all round the castle and I know there isn't any way of getting in. Well, there must be, said Philip. Come on, let's find a comfortable place in the courtyard and have our tea. I'm jolly hungry again. They went into the hot and sunny courtyard. They sat down, and Dinah undid the tea packet. There was plenty there for everyone, but all the lemonade had been drunk at dinner time. I'm so thirsty, I simply must have something to drink with my sandwiches, said Lucy Ann. My tongue will hang out like a dog's in a minute. Everyone felt the same, but nobody particularly wanted to go into that big, lonely kitchen and bring back water in the cardboard cups. I know. We'll see if the spring that runs down to our cottage is anywhere about, said Philip. It's supposed to begin in this courtyard, I know. He got up, and Button went with him. It was Button who found the spring. It gushed out near the wall that ran round the castle, almost at the foot of the tower. Jack looked with interest at the bubbling spring. It gushed out from a hole in the rock and then disappeared again under a tangle of brambles into a kind of little tunnel that ran below the tower. I suppose it goes right underneath the tower and comes out again further on down the hillside, thought the boy. The children enjoyed the icy cold water. They finished all the tea and lay back in the sun watching the golden eagles who were once more soaring upwards on wide wings. This has been an exciting sort of day, said Philip lazily. What do you feel now about spending a few days here, Jack? Won't you be too lonely? I'll have Kiki and the eagles, said Jack, <laughs> and all the rabbits round about too. I wouldn't like to be here all alone now, said Dinah. Not until I knew who pumped that water I should feel creepy all the time. Jack, you won't really stay here by yourself, will you? <laughs> I don't see why not, said Jack with a laugh. I'm not scared. I think Philip's right when he says it was probably only some rambler who pumped himself a spot of water. After all, if we're curious enough to make our way in here, other people may be too. Yes, but how did they come? persisted Dinah. <laughs> Same way as old Button came in, I expect, said Philip. Dinah stared at him. Well, how did Button get in? she said. Find out that, and we don't need to use the plank every time. I know what we'll do, said Jack. We'll leave old Button behind here when we go across the plank, and we'll watch and see where he comes out. Then we can use his entrance, if it's possible, the next time we come. Yes, that's a good idea, said Lucy Ann, and Tassie nodded too. The little girl was puzzled to know how Button had got into the castle. She felt so certain there was no way in beside the two doors, and the window through which they themselves had come. Come on, time to go home, said Jack, and they all got up. I'll be back here tomorrow, I hope. They went back into the castle and up the wide stone stair. Diana felt a little uncomfortable and kept close to the others. So did Tassie. 
They went down the wide corridor and looked in room after room to find the one with the plank. Golly, don't say it's gone, said Jack, after they'd looked into about six rooms. This is odd. I'm sure the room wasn't as far along as this. But it was, for in the very next room they saw the edge of their plank on the stone sill. They hurried over to it. Jack went across first with Kiki clutching his shoulder. He got across safely and then caught hold of the rope on the other side. He helped Lucy Ann across, then Dinah, and then Tassie. Lucy Ann slipped hurriedly down the cliffside, followed by Dinah. Tassie leapt down like a goat without even touching the rope. Then came Philip, and poor little Button was left behind, yelping. You go your own way and join us outside the castle, called back Philip. Button jumped up to the sill but kept falling back. The children heard him barking away by himself as they made their way down the tunnel-like passage into the sunshine. I may have to go back for Button, you know, if he doesn't come after us, said Philip. I couldn't really leave him behind, but foxes are so sharp. I bet he'll come rushing after us in a minute. Keep a good look out, then, said Jack. But it wasn't any good keeping a look out, for suddenly Button was at their heels, leaping up at Philip, making yelping sounds of happiness and love. Nobody saw him come. Nobody knew how he had got out of the castle. <laughs> how annoying, said Jack with a laugh. Button, how did you get out? They were all so tired when they got in that they could hardly tell their adventures. When Philip told about the puddle of water below the pump, Mrs. Mannering laughed. <laughs> Trust you children to imagine something to scare yourselves with, she said. Probably the pump leaks a bit on its own. It's funny about those old furnished rooms, though. It shows how the villagers fear the castle if no one has interfered with the furniture. Even thieves, apparently, will not venture there. Mrs. Mannering was intensely interested in the Golden Eagles. She and Philip and Jack talked about them till darkness fell. Mrs. Mannering was quite willing for Jack to try and take pictures of the young eagle with its parents. If only you can make a good hide, she said, and get the birds used to it, so that you can lie there and take what pictures you please. It would be marvellous. Philip's father used to do things like that. Can I go with Jack, please, Auntie Ally? asked Lucy Ann, who couldn't bear to let Jack go off by himself for even a day or two. No, you can't, Lucy Ann. You can come up each day and bring me food if you like, said Jack, as he saw Lucy Ann's disappointed face. And I can always signal to you from the tower. You know, we could see this house from the tower, so of course you could see the tower from this house. Oh, yes, you signal good night to us each night, said Lucy Ann, cheering up. That'd be fun. I shall look at the tower when I wake and know you're there. I'll wave a white hanky from my window when I see you waving one. Tassie couldn't imagine how anyone could possibly dare to sleep alone in the old castle. She thought Jack must be the bravest boy in the world. Time for you to go home, Tassie, said Mrs. Mannering. Go along. You can come back tomorrow. Tassie disappeared, running off to her tumble-down cottage and her scolding, untidy mother. The others helped Mrs. Mannering to clear the supper away, and the two girls washed up, half asleep. They went to bed, to dream of the old deserted castle of strange, cobwebby rooms, high towers, screaming eagles, and a puddle on the floor below the pump. That's really a puzzle, said Philip to himself as he fell asleep. <sighs> but I'm too tired to think about it now. <sighs> the next day was rainy. Great clouds swept over the hillside, making it misty and damp. Blow, said Jack. I did want to go up to the castle today. I feel that young eagle may fly at any time now, and I don't want to miss its first flight. Have you got plenty of films for your camera? asked Philip. Well, it wouldn't be much good wanting them if I hadn't got enough, said Jack. I couldn't buy them in that tiny village as only one shop. You could take the train and go off to the town, said Mrs. Mannering. Why don't you do that, instead of staying here cooped up all day? I can see Dinah is longing to squabble with someone. Dinah laughed. Yes, it would be fun to take the train and go off shopping, she said. Let's do it. So they put on Max and Sou'Westers and hurried to catch the train. It was twenty miles to the nearest town. It took the train a whole hour to get there. The children had left the train and were walking down the street when suddenly a voice hailed them and made them jump. Hello, hello. Whoever would have thought of seeing you here? 
The children turned round at once, and Kiki let out a delighted squawk. Bill Smugs! cried the children, and ran to the ruddy-faced, twinkling-eyed man who had hailed them. Lucy Ann gave him a hug, Dinah smiled in delight, and the two boys banged Bill Smugs on the back. Bill Smugs was not his real name. It was a name he'd told the children the year before, when they'd come across him trying to track some clever forgers. Come and have lunch with me, said Bill Smugs. Or have you any other plans? I really must know what you're doing here. I thought you were at home for the holidays. What are you doing here? asked Philip. On the track of forgers again? I bet you're on some sort of exciting job. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, said Bill, smiling. Come on, we'll go to this hotel. It looks about the best one this town can produce. <laughs> It was an exciting lunch. Bill Smugs was an exciting person. They talked eagerly about the thrilling adventures he'd had with them the year before. Oh, yes, that certainly was an adventure, said Bill, helping himself to apple tart and ice cream. And now, as I said before, you really must tell me what you're doing in this part of the world. The children told him interrupting each other in their eagerness, especially Jack, who was longing to tell him every detail about the eagles. Bill listened and ate solidly, giving Kiki titbits every now and again. "'What a pity you're twenty miles away or more,' said Bill. "'I'm stuck here in this district for a time I'm afraid I can't leave. But if I can, I'll come over and see you. Maybe your mother would put me up for a day or two, then I can come up to this wonderful castle of yours and see the eagles.' "'Oh, yes, do come!' they all cried. "'We aren't on the telephone,' added Philip, "'but never mind, just come. We're sure to be there. Come at any time.' "'Right,' said Bill. "'I might be able to slip over next week. Can't tell you any more, I'm afraid, but if I don't make any headway with what I'm supposed to be doing, I'll have a break. Come along to see you and your nice mother. Give her my kind regards and say Bill Smugs will come and pay his respects if he possibly can.' "'We'll have to go,' said Jack, regretfully looking at his watch. "'There's only the one train back, and we've got a bit of shopping to do. "'Goodbye, Bill. It's been grand to bump into you like this.' <laughs> "'Goodbye. See you soon, I hope,' said Bill. "'And off they ran to catch their train. "'Mrs. Mannering was delighted to hear that they had by chance met Bill Smugs again, "'for she felt very grateful to him for the help he'd given the children "'in their amazing adventure the year before. "'If he comes, I'll sleep in with you girls, and he can have my room,' she said. Good old Bill. It'll be nice to see him again. He must lead an interesting life, always hunting down criminals and wicked people. I bet he'd have been after the wicked old man who used to live in the castle, said Lucy Ann. It'll be fun taking him up there, Jack. I hope it won't be raining again tomorrow. Luckily, it was fine. The sun rose out of a clear sky, and not even the smallest cloud showed itself. "'We'll all come up with you, Jack,' said Philip, "'and help you carry what you want. "'You'll need a couple of thick rugs and some food, a, "'a candle or two, and a torch, "'and your camera, and films, of course.' "'Carrying various things, the little party set off once more. "'Dinah was glad to feel her torch safely in her pocket. "'She didn't mean to stand in dark rooms again "'and feel cobwebs clutching at her hair. "'They climbed in through the window as before.' Button again appeared in the courtyard from somewhere, though still no one knew where. Kiki flew to the crag on which the eagles had their nest, yelping her eagle scream in what was plainly meant to be a kindly greeting. The startled eagles rose up in surprise, and then, seeing the strange and talkative bird again, circled round her. Quite clearly, they didn't mind her in the least. It wasn't long before Jack climbed up to see if the young eagle was still in the nest. It was. He looked around for a place to make a good hide in. There was one spot that looked ideal. It was a thick gorse bush, almost on a level with the eagle's ledge. Jack thought he could probably squeeze into the hollow middle of it and make an opening for his camera in the prickly branches. The only thing is, I'll get terribly pricked, he thought. He told the others, and they agreed with him that it would be a splendid place if a bit painful. "'You'll have to wrap this rug round you,' said Lucy Ann, holding up the thick rug she'd brought. "'If you creep in with this round you, you'll be all right.' "'Good idea,' said Jack. They went up to the tower top and had their dinner there again, seeing the countryside spread out below once more in all its beauty. "'I'd like Bill Smugs to see this,' said Jack. 
We must bring him up here when he comes. Where do you think you'll sleep tonight, Jack? asked Lucy Ann anxiously. And will you wave your hanky from the tower before you go to sleep? I'll watch for it. I'll wave my white shirt, said Jack. You probably wouldn't notice anything so small as a hanky, though you can borrow my old field glasses and look through them if you like. They're in my room. Oh, yes, I will, said Lucy Ann. You haven't said where you'll sleep, Jack. You won't really sleep on one of those old sofas, will you? No, I don't think so. More likely in a sandy corner of the courtyard, said Jack. There's a sandy bit over there. Look, it'll be warm with the sun. If I curl up there and wrap the rugs all round me, I'll be very snug. Well, it's time for us to go, said Philip at last. Jack said goodbye to them all as they went across the plank. He held Button in his arms, quite determined to follow him and find out where he went when he got out of the castle. One by one they crossed the plank and disappeared. Their voices died away. Jack was alone. He went down the wide corridor, down the stone stairway that led to the dark hall and out into the courtyard, where the last rays of the sun still shone. When he came to the yard, he set the wriggling fox cub down. Now, you show me where you go, he said. Button darted off at once, far too quickly for Jack. By the time the boy had run a few steps after him, the fox cub had disappeared, and there was no trace of him. Oh, blow, said Jack, annoyed. I did mean to discover the way you went out this time, but you're so jolly nippy. I suppose you've already joined the others now. Jack went to try and arrange his camera safely in the gorse bush. He had a very good camera indeed, given to him last Christmas by Bill Smuggs. He wrapped one of the rugs round him, as Lucy Ann had suggested, and began to squeeze through the prickly branches. Some of the prickles reached his flesh even through the thick rug. Kiki sat beside the bush, watching Jack in surprise. Ah, what a pity! What a pity! What a pity! It is a pity that I'm being pricked like this, groaned Jack. But he cheered up when he saw what a fine view of the eagle's nest he had, and of the ledge where the eagle sat to look out at the surrounding country. By making an opening in the bush on the side where the nest was, he managed to point his camera in exactly the right direction, and lodged it very firmly on its tripod legs. He looked through it to see what kind of a picture he would get. Perfect, thought the boy joyfully. I won't take one now because the light is awkward, but tomorrow morning would be exactly right. Then the sun will be just where I want it. The boy read a book until daylight faded. Then he remembered about waving his shirt from the tower, so up he went, hoping he hadn't left it too late for Lucy Ann to see. He stood on the top of the tower and stripped off his white shirt. Then he waved it gaily in the strong breeze there, looking down on the cottage far below as he waved. And from the topmost window there came a flash of white. Lucy Ann was waving back. He's just waved, she called to Dinah, who was undressing. I saw the white shirt. Oh, good. Now I know he's all right and will soon be curling himself up to go to sleep. Why you must fuss so about Jack, I don't know, said Dinah, jumping into bed. I never fuss about Philip. You're silly, Lucy Ann. I don't care, thought Lucy Ann, as she settled down in bed. I'm glad to know Jack is safe. Somehow I don't like him being all alone in that horrid old castle. Jack went down the stone stairways of the tower, whistling softly. Kiki whistled with him. If it was a tune she knew, she would whistle it all through with Jack. They came into the old courtyard. There was no sign of the eagles. They were probably roosting now, but at Jack's coming there was a general scurrying all around the yard. <laughs> Rabbits! said Jack in delight. Golly! <laughs> what hundreds of them! He went over to the soft sand, taking with him the thick rugs and a packet of chocolate biscuits. He curled himself up and lay there, watching the rabbits creeping out of their holes again. I bet the eagles catch a good few of those rabbits, thought Jack, suddenly feeling sleepy. He finished his last biscuit, pulled the rugs more closely around him and went to sleep. What woke Jack? He never knew, but something woke him with a jump. He sat up, and Kiki awoke too giving an annoyed little squawk. 
I wonder what woke me, thought Jack, looking round the shadowy yard. He listened intently, but he could hear nothing save the hoot of an owl on the hillside. He glanced up at the tower from which he'd waved his white shirt, and suddenly stiffened in surprise. Surely that was a light he saw flash there. He stared intently, waiting for it to come again. It had seemed rather like the sudden flash of a torch, but it didn't come again. It seemed rather weird. Jack wondered what to do. He didn't really feel inclined to get up and find out what the flash was, if it had been a flash. He was beginning to doubt that it was now. If only it would come again, he would know. Warning Kiki to be quiet, he made his way very carefully across the yard to the entrance of the castle, keeping in the blackest shadows. The feel of Kiki's feet on his shoulder was somehow very comforting. He went into the vast hall and listened. There was not a sound to be heard. He switched on his torch, cautiously covering it with his handkerchief. The hall was empty. Jack went up the wide stone stairway and found his way to the wall that led to the tower. He walked quietly along it, keeping close to one edge, and soon came to the tower. Shall I go up or not? wondered the boy. I don't want to in the least. If there's anyone there, they can't be up to any good. Did I imagine that flash? He screwed up his courage and stole up the tower stairway. There was no one in the tower room. He crept up the stairway that led to the very top and put his head carefully out. The moon's light was enough to show him that there was nobody there either. Well, I just must have imagined it, thought the boy. How silly of me. I'll go back to bed again. Down he went once more, Kiki still on his shoulder. As he came into the wide hall, he suddenly stopped still. He had heard a sound. What could it be? It sounded like a muffled clanking, and then, surely, that was the splash of water. Is it somebody in the kitchen? Somebody getting a drink of water again? wondered Jack, feeling a prickle of panic go down his back. Golly, I don't like this. I wish the others were here. Then, overcome by fear, he fled out of the hall and into the moonlight yard, keeping in the shadows. He was trembling. In a minute or two, he was ashamed of himself. Why am I running away, he thought. This won't do. Just to show myself that I'm no coward, I'll walk into that kitchen and see who's there. It's a tramp, I expect, who knows the way in. He'll be far more frightened to see me than I shall be to see him. Boldly, but very quickly, the boy went back into the dark, brooding castle. Through the hall he went, and made his way softly to the kitchen entrance. He slipped inside the doorway, and then went behind the door where he waited, listening and watching to see if any light was shown. But there was dead silence. There was no clank of the pump, there was no splash of water. Jack waited for two or three minutes, with Kiki perfectly silent. He couldn't even hear anyone breathing. The kitchen must be empty. I'll switch on my torch very quickly, flash it round the kitchen, and see if there's anyone standing quietly there, he thought. I can easily run out of the door if there is. So he took his torch from his pocket, and suddenly pressed down the switch. He flashed it to the sink where the pump stood. There was no one there. He flashed it all around the kitchen. It was quite empty. There was no sign of anyone at all. Jack heaved a sigh of relief. He went across to the sink and examined the floor beside it. There was, again, a puddle there. But was it a freshly made one from the sink splashes? Or was it the same one they themselves had made when they used the pump? Jack couldn't tell. It's a puzzle, he said to Kiki in a whisper. I suppose the clank and splashing were all my silly imagination. I was frightened, and people always imagine things then. I imagined that flash in the tower, and I imagined the clanking noise and the splashing. Kiki, <laughs> I'm as timid as Lucy Ann. I really am. Still feeling a bit puzzled, but rather ashamed of all his fears and alarms, Jack went back to his bed in the courtyard. It seemed uncomfortably hard now. Also, he was a bit cold. He pulled the rugs round him and tried to get comfortable. He shut his eyes and told himself to go to sleep. 
The moon seemed to have gone now, and everything was pitch black. Whatever he heard or saw, Jack was determined he was not going to leave his bed again that night. At last he fell asleep, just as the dawn was making the eastern sky silvery. He didn't see it turn gold and pink, nor did he see the first soaring flight of the two eagles. He slept soundly, and so did Kiki. But she awoke at the first yelping scream of one of the eagles and answered it with one of her marvellous imitations. That woke Jack with a jump, and he sat up. Kiki flew off his shoulder, waited till he called her, and flew back again. Jack rubbed his eyes and yawned. Oh, oh, I'm hungry, he said to Kiki. Are you? Kiki scratched her beak with one of her feet and looked at Jack. Uh, what a pity! What a pity! she remarked. Yes, I think it was a pity we disturbed ourselves too much, said Jack. I was an idiot, Kiki. Now that it's broad daylight and I'm wide awake, I begin to think I must have dreamt or imagined all that happened in the night. Not that anything much did happen anyway. <laughs> Kiki listened with her head on one side. Jack unwrapped himself from the rug. I tell you what, Kiki, we won't either of us mention that flash in the tower or that mysterious clanking or splashing we thought we heard, see? The others would only laugh at us, and Lucy Ann and Tassie might be frightened. I'm sure it was all my imagination. After he'd had his breakfast, Jack went to his hide. He wrapped the thickest rug round him and crawled in through the prickly stems of the gorse. Kiki remained outside this time. When he was in the hollow centre of the bush, Jack examined his camera to make sure it was all right. It was. He looked through the shutter to see if he had it trained exactly on the nest. Perfect, he thought. That young eagle appears to be asleep. I might get a good picture when it wakes up. I suppose the other birds are soaring miles high into the sky. It was boring waiting for the eagle to wake up, but Jack didn't mind. Both he and Philip knew that the ability to keep absolutely still and silent for a long time on end was essential to the study of birds and animals in their natural surroundings. So Jack settled back in the gorse bush and waited. The young eagle suddenly awoke and stretched out first one wing and then the other. It climbed to the edge of the nest and looked out over the ledge, waiting for its parents to come back. Fine, whispered Jack, and pressed the trigger of the camera to take the eagle's picture. Then, with yelps, the two grown eagles came gliding down on outspread wings, and the young one greeted them gladly, spreading out its wings and quivering them. One of the eagles had a young hare clutched in its claws. It dropped it into the nest. At once, the youngster covered the food with its big wings, cowered over it, and began to pull at it hungrily with its powerful beak. Jack snapped it. All three birds heard the click and looked towards the gorse bush suspiciously. The young one fell upon its meal and ate until it could eat no more. Then it sank back into the big nest. The female eagle finished the dead hare in a very short while. Jack got another wonderful snap whilst it was tearing up its food. This time, except for an inquiring look in the direction of the click, the eagles took no notice. Good, thought Jack. They won't mind the click soon, or the gleaming eye of the camera. He spent a pleasant morning using up the rest of his film, delighted to think of the wonderful pictures he could develop. Kiki suddenly gave a most excited squawk, making the two grown eagles rise in the air in alarm. She flew into the air and made for the wall that ran round the courtyard. Jack, peering through the back of his hiding place, saw her fly right over the wall and disappear. Now where's she gone, he thought. I was just going to take a picture of her and the two eagles together. Kiki was gone for about half an hour before Jack saw her again. Then she came into the courtyard on Tassie's shoulder. She had heard the other children coming up the hillside and had flown to meet them. They had got into the castle in the usual way and were now looking for Jack. The eagles soared into the air when they heard the children coming towards their crag. Jack gave a hail from the inside of his hide. I'm here! Hello, it's good to see you. Wait a sec and I'll be out. He crawled out with the rug round him and went down to the others. Lucy Ann eyed him anxiously and was relieved to see him looking cheerful and well. We brought a fine dinner, said Philip. Mother managed to get some cooked ham and a big fruit cake in the village. Oh, good, said Jack, realising he was terribly hungry. 
We've got some ginger beer, too, said Dinah. Where shall we have our dinner, on top of the tower again, or where? Uh, here, I think, said Jack, because the light is perfect for taking pictures this morning, and if those eagles come back, I want a few more snaps of them. I have an idea they're going to make that young one fly soon. The female eagle tried to tip it off the edge of the nest this morning. What sort of a night did you have, Jack? asked Lucy Ann, who was sitting as close to Jack as she could. Well, very good, said Jack airily. I woke up once, took some time to go to sleep again. He was determined not to say anything about his alarms and fears in the night. They seemed so silly now in the full sunshine with people all around him. The four children stayed with Jack till after tea. Each crept into his hide to watch the eagles. They went up to the tower again, and Jack cautiously looked round to see if anything was different about the tower. A cigarette end, a scrap of paper, but there was nothing at all. "'Won't you come back with us tonight, Jack?' asked Lucianne. "'Course not,' said Jack, though secretly he felt he would rather like to. "'Is it likely, just as I'm certain that young eagle is going to learn to fly?' Oh, "'All right,' said Lucianne with a sigh. I don't know why I hate you being here alone in this horrid old castle, but I just do. Eh, it's time to go, said Philip, getting up. We brought you another rug, Jack, in case you felt cold. Coming to see us off at the window? Yes, of course, said Jack. And they all went inside the castle, their footsteps echoing on the stone floor. They went to the room where the plank reached to the windowsill, and one by one they got across. Lucy Ann called a farewell to Jack. Thank you for waving your shirt to me last night, she called. And, oh, Jack, I saw you flashing your torch from the tower later on, too. I was in bed, but I was awake, and I saw the flash of the torch three or four times. It was nice of you to do that. I was glad to see it and to know you were awake, too. Come on, Lucy Ann, for goodness sake, called Dinah. All right, I'm coming, said Lucy Ann, and slid down the creepers to the ground. Everyone called goodbye, and then they were gone. But Jack was left feeling most puzzled and uncomfortable. So there had been someone in the tower last night flashing a torch. He hadn't dreamt it or imagined it. It was true. Lucy Ann saw it. So that proves I wasn't mistaken as I thought, said the boy to himself as he went back into the courtyard. It's terribly mysterious. That clanking I heard... And the splashing must have been real, too. There is someone else here. But who? And why? He wished now that he'd told the others the happenings in the night. Shall I go after the others and join them? he thought. No, I won't. I'll wait and try and find out who's here. Fancy Lucy Ann seeing those flashes. I am glad she told me. Jack wandered back to his hide. He felt safe there. He was sure no one would ever think of looking in the very middle of a prickly, thick gorse bush for anyone. As evening fell, he felt sleepy. Should he try and go to sleep now and keep awake later on? Could he possibly go to sleep in the hollow gorse bush? He curled up in the thickest rug and made a pillow of another one. Kiki crawled in beside him and perched uncomfortably on his knees. Jack slept for a time. Then he awoke suddenly, feeling dreadfully uncomfortable. He looked at the phosphorescent hands of his watch and saw that it was ten past midnight. Hmm, said Jack. Just about the time that someone in the castle starts to wake up. I'd better get out of here and watch and listen. He crept painfully out of the bush and, climbing silently down the crag, came into the yard and stood listening. There was no sound to be heard except the wind blowing fairly hard. And then Jack thought he heard the far-off sound of water splashing again and the clank of the pump handle. He stood listening. After a while, he felt sure he heard quiet footsteps on stone somewhere. Was it someone walking on the castle wall, going to the tower to flash a torch again? Well... If he's gone to the tower, he's safely out of the castle, thought Jack. I'll go in and see if I can discover where he hides. He must live somewhere.
boy, stole quietly into the castle, Kiki on his shoulder. He was too excited to feel frightened tonight. He went into the hall of the castle, and at once something struck him with surprise. There was a light coming from somewhere. Jack stared round him, puzzled. Then he saw where it came from. It came from the floor, or rather, underneath the floor of the hall. The boy stepped forward cautiously. He came to a hole in the floor of the hall, and up from this hole came the light. Stone steps went down into whatever was below, cellar or dungeon, he didn't know. In a flash, Jack was down the stone steps, and then looked around him in the very greatest surprise. He seemed to be in a kind of museum. He was in a large underground room with tapestries on the stone walls and a thick covering on the floor. Round the room stood suits of armour, just as there often is in a museum. Old, heavy chairs stood here and there, and a long, narrow table with crockery and glass on it ran the length of the room. In the corner was a big, old four-poster bed hung with heavy tapestries. Jack went over to it. It had obviously been slept in. There was a pitcher of ice-cold water on the table. Got from the pump, I suppose, thought Jack. At this moment he thought he heard a noise, and in sudden fright he darted up the stone steps to the top, taking Kiki with him. He hopped out just in time and went into one of the furnished rooms, the old drawing room. But in going inside he fell over a stool and came to the ground. The footsteps outside stopped suddenly. The torchlight went out. Evidently the person was standing perfectly still and listening hard. With his heart beating fast, Jack slipped round the corner of an old couch and knelt there with Kiki on his shoulder. The boy heard a cautious footstep coming into the room. Then there was silence again. Then another footstep sounded a little nearer. Jack's hair began to prickle on his scalp and stand up straight. If the man came round the couch and switched on his torch, he would be bound to see Jack. The boy's heart pounded away, and his forehead felt suddenly wet. Kiki clung to his shoulder, feeling the fright of her master. She couldn't bear it any longer. She suddenly rose into the air and flew at the head of the unseen man, giving one of the yelping screams she'd picked up from the eagles. He uttered a startled exclamation and tried to beat off the bird. His torch clattered to the floor. Kiki screeched again, this time like an express train, and the man lashed out at her. Kiki found Jack once more and perched on the crouching boy, growling like a dog. Good heavens, this place is full of birds and dogs, said someone in a disgusted voice. The man felt over the floor for his torch and at last found it. Ha, broken, he said, and Jack heard the click as he tried to switch it on. One of those eagles, I suppose. What does it want to come indoors for? Muttering, the man went out. Jack heard a curious grating sound, and then there was complete silence. At last he got cautiously up and tiptoed to the door. He peeped out. There was now no light to be seen shining up dimly from underground. All was darkness and silence. Without trying to see what had happened to the curious opening, he ran into the courtyard and made his way back to the old gorse bush. He felt safe there. After an hour or two of thinking and wondering, Jack at last fell asleep again. He awoke to find little fingers of sunlight coming through the gorse bush, and was glad that day had come. He crawled out of the bush and breakfasted on biscuits and plums. Suddenly he went stiff and looked in amazement at two men walking through the courtyard. They were going towards the castle. How in the world had they got in? There simply must be some way in. Or had the men keys to one of the big gates or doors? The men went into the castle. Evidently, unlike the hidden man, they did not fear being seen in daylight. Will the hidden man tell them he thought there was someone about last night, thought Jack in a panic. Will they come and look for me? Jack crawled hurriedly back into the bush again, not waiting to wrap himself up in the rug and getting terribly scratched. When he was inside, he remembered that he'd left some paper bags in the courtyard below with some apple cores in them. Dash, he thought. If those are found, they'll know there's someone here besides themselves. He waited in the bush for an hour or so, taking peeps at the eagle's nest now and again. Then he heard the sound of voices and peeped between the prickly branches to see who it was. 
It was the two men again. They were great, hulking men, one of them with a black beard. As they came near, he tried to hear what they said, but they were not talking any language he knew. Suddenly, they stopped, and with an exclamation, the bearded man picked up Jack's paper bags. He saw the apple cores inside and showed the other man. The cores were still moist. The men then separated and began to make a thorough search of the castle, the towers, the walls, and the courtyard. Jack watched them through a chink in the bush. Kiki was absolutely quiet. Then the men came across to the crag where the eagles nested. It was plain they were going to climb up to explore that place too, in case anyone was hiding there. Jack crouched as still as a mouse when an owl is near. The men came right up the crag and gave a cry of amazement when they saw the eagle's nest with the young one in. Evidently, they didn't know the ways of eagles, for they went quite near to the nest, and one of the men put out his hand. There was a whir of mighty wings, and the female eagle seemed to drop like a stone from the sky onto the man's head. He turned away, while the other man beat off the angry bird. Jack had a marvellous view of the first man the eagle had attacked. He was still looking up, showing the whole of his face and his neck in an open-collared shirt. Jack pressed his camera release. Click! Both men heard the click of the camera and looked puzzled. Then, as the female eagle came at them again, they hurriedly descended the crag and ran down into the courtyard. Jack waited in the bush, watching the eagles, who had been much upset by the visit of the two men. Soon it was plain to Jack that they meant to take the young bird away from the nest. It must learn to fly. The boy forgot his fears in his interest at the efforts of the two eagles to make the young one fly. They persuaded it to the edge of the nest, and then, with a push, dislodged it onto the ledge on which the nest was built. The young bird tried to get back again, but the female eagle flew round and round it, yelping, trying to tell it that it must go with her. The young one listened, or seemed to listen, then turned its head away, bored. Then, for no reason that Jack could see, it suddenly spread out its wings. They were enormous. The boy had been taking snap after snap, and now he took a splendid picture of the young eagle trying out his wings. The youngster flapped his wings so hard that he danced about on tiptoe, and then, most superbly, he took off from the ledge, and rose into the air, with his parents screaming on either side of him. He could fly! Marvellous, said Jack, and cautiously took the roll of film from his camera. As he slipped a new roll of film into his camera, he heard the voices of the other children. He was very glad, but where were the men? He crept out from the bush and climbed down to join them. They saw by his face that he had news for them. Lucy Ann ran to him. Has anything happened, Jack? You look very serious. Look, what do you think? We've come up with piles of things because Mrs. Mannering says we can stay for two or three days. She's got to go to Dinah's Aunt Polly, who's been taken ill again, but she'll be back soon. And she thought that we might as well join you up here if we wanted to, said Dinah. But you don't look very thrilled about it, Jack. Well, listen, said Jack. There's something odd here, really odd. I don't know if you ought to come. In fact... As I've really taken all the snaps I need to take of the eagles, I honestly think it would be better if we all went home. Go back to Spring Cottage, said Philip in surprise. But why? Quick, tell us everything, Jack. All right. But first, where's Tassie, said Jack, looking round for the little gypsy girl. Her mother wouldn't let her come, said Lucy Ann. I think Tassie's got an awful mother, said Philip. Anyway, she can't come, but go on, tell your story. Well, I suppose... I suppose you didn't by any chance meet anyone coming down the hill, did you? said Jack, suddenly, thinking that perhaps the two men had gone. Mm, we saw what looked like three men in the distance, said Philip. Why? Three men? said Jack, thoughtfully. That looks as if the hidden man went too, then. What are you talking about? cried Dinah, impatiently. Jack began his story. The others listened in astonishment. Finally, Jack said, I think we ought to go back to Spring Cottage. We've dealt with dangerous men before, and it wasn't pleasant. We'd better all go back. Right, said Philip. I agree with you. 
But seeing that you think all three men are out of the way, what about having a squint at that hidden room? All right, said Jack. They all went into the vast hall, and the boys switched on their torches. Jack led them to the back of the hall and looked at the floor. There was no hole to be seen at all. It had gone completely. The children looked about for a trap door in the floor, but there was none. Philip began to wonder if Jack had dreamt it all. Then his sharp eyes saw a spike made of iron set deeply in the wall at the back of the hall. Philip took hold of it. Here's something strange, he began, and pulled hard. The spike moved smoothly in some sort of groove, and suddenly there was a grating noise at Lucy Ann's feet. She leapt back with a startled cry. The ground was opening at her feet. A big stone there was disappearing downwards in some mysterious fashion, exposing a short flight of stone steps leading down into the hidden room that Jack had seen the night before. The children gasped. Philip, Lucy Ann, and Dinah went eagerly down the steps to examine everything. They saw the tapestries on the walls, they saw the old suits of armour standing round the room, and the big, heavy chairs that looked as if they were made for giants, not men. Where's Jack? said Philip. Going to get Kiki, said Dinah. Oh, look, Philip, here's another spike in the wall, just like the one upstairs. What happens when you pull it? She pulled it, and with a grating noise the stone swung up and into place, imprisoning the three children down below. They watched the great stone slide into place like magic, but Philip suddenly felt worried. Dinah, let me have that spike. I hope to goodness it'll move the stone back again. The boy pulled at it, but it remained fixed. He jerked it. It would not move at all. It closes the hole in the floor, but it doesn't open it, he said. Jack will be along soon, said Dinah, and he'll work the spike upstairs in the hall to open it again. We didn't worry. I suppose he will, said Philip. You are an idiot, Dinah, messing about with things before you know what they do. Well, you'd have done the same thing yourself. All right, all right, said Philip. An idea came to him. <laughs> I say, I'll play a trick on Jack, he said. I'll get inside one of these suits of armour and hide. Then, when Jack opens the hole and comes down, I'll suddenly step off one of these pedestals the armour is on with a frightful clanging noise and scare him stiff. The girls laughed. All right, said Lucy Ann. Hurry up. Before long, Philip was in the suit of armour. He had the helmet on his head and the visor over his face. He could see quite well through the visor, but nobody would know there was anyone inside the armoured suit. He got back on the pedestal with a lot of clanking. The girls giggled. <laughs> Won't Jack get an awful shock? I wish he'd come, said Lucy Ann. Are you comfortable, Philip? asked Dinah. Well, surely, golly, I wouldn't much like to go to war in this. I'd never be able to walk more than a few yards. <laughs> the girls wandered round the room. They looked at the tapestry scenes, they sat in the enormous old chairs, they fingered the ancient weapons that were arranged here and there. What is Jack doing? said Lucy Ann at last, beginning to feel anxious. He's been simply ages. Oh, Dinah, you don't think those men have come back to you and captured him? I shouldn't think so, said Dinah, who was also beginning to feel rather worried. You know, you know, I don't believe those men we saw were the men from the castle. I'm pretty certain they were men belonging to the farm. One was that enormously tall fellow we sometimes see when we fetch eggs. I believe you're right, Philip, said Lucy Ann, scared. I do wonder what Jack is doing, said Dinah. I do wish he'd come. Jack was certainly a long time coming, but he couldn't help it. He had gone after Kiki, who had flown into the furnished room in which they'd both hidden the night before, and suddenly, from the window, he had seen the three men in a corner of the yard. The boy darted back into the hall and went to the place where the hole should be, but it was gone, and a stone now covered the entrance to the room. Should he open the hole and see if the others were down there? Would the men come into the hall just as he was doing it? He could hear their voices quite clearly now. Jack darted back into the furnished room and hid behind a long tapestry curtain. Two of the men now separated and went off into the castle, 
evidently to make another good search. The third man stood at the great doorway, puffing at a cigarette and apparently keeping a watch over the courtyard. It was impossible for Jack to open the way to the hidden room, for the man at the doorway would see and hear him. The man finished his cigarette. He turned and came into the hall. Jack heard his feet echoing and held his breath. Was he going back to the hidden room? He was. He walked to the back of the hall and felt about in the wall there for the spike. Jack crept to the door of the room he was hiding in and peered through the crack. The man pulled at the spike and the stone moved with a grating sound. Dinah and Lucianne heard the grating noise of the stone as it moved and looked up. Philip peered through his visor, hoping Jack was coming at last. But to their horror, a man stood on the steps, looking at them in the greatest astonishment and anger. The two girls stared at him and trembled. He had an enormous nose, narrow eyes and the thinnest lips imaginable. Shaggy eyebrows hung over his eyes, almost like a sheepdog's hair. So said the man. So, you come here and you go to my room. What is the meaning of this? The girls were terrified, and Lucy Ann began to sob. Jack, listening, longed to push the man down the steps and break his neck. Then he heard the footsteps of the other two men returning from their hunt. The first man heard them too and went back up the stairs to the top. He called to the others in a language Jack didn't understand, evidently telling them to come and see what he'd found. Philip, still hidden in the suit of armour, took the opportunity of whispering instructions to the girls. Don't be frightened. They'll probably only think you're two girls visiting the old castle. You tell them that. Don't say a word about me or Jack. He couldn't say any more because all three men now came down the steps and into the hidden room. One man had a dense black beard, the other was clean-shaven, but the man the girls had already seen was the ugliest of a really ugly trio. Lucy Ann began to cry again. Dinah was very scared, but she would not cry. What are you here for? asked the shaggy-browed man. Now, you tell us everything, or you may be very, very sorry. We only came to have a look at the castle, said Dinah, trying to keep her voice from trembling. Does it belong to you? We didn't know. How did you find this room? demanded the bearded man, scowling. By accident said Dinah. We were so surprised. Does anyone outside this castle know we are here, or anything about this room? asked the shaggy man. No, nobody, said Dinah, truthfully. Is anyone with you? asked the bearded man, suspiciously. Well, you can see that for yourselves, said Dinah. Please let us go. We won't come here again, we promise. No, little missus, you must stay here till our work is done. Then, when it no longer matters, maybe we shall let you go. I said, maybe. It depends on how you behave. To the girls' intense relief, the men allowed them to go up the stone steps into the hall. Then the hole closed once more, and they were left alone. We must escape, whispered Dinah, taking Lucy Ann's hand. We must get away immediately and bring help to Philip. I dare think what would happen to him if those men found him. Where's Jack? sobbed Lucy Ann. I want him. Jack was not far away. As soon as he heard the stone close the hole up and recognised the girls' voices, he darted out of the old drawing room. Lucy Ann saw him and ran to him gladly. He put his arms round her and patted her. It's all right, Lucy Ann, it's all right. We'll soon be out of here and we'll get help to rescue Philip. Don't worry, don't cry any more. The boy guided her to the wide stone stairs that led to the upper rooms of the castle. We'll get across the plank in no time, he said. Then we'll be safe. We'll soon rescue Philip too. Don't be afraid. Up they went and up. Then along the long corridor, lit dimly by its slit windows, they came to the room they used for the plank. Dinah ran gladly to the window, eager to slip across to safety, but she paused in dismay. There was no plank. I'm afraid, said Jack, I'm very much afraid that the men discovered how we got in and removed the plank. Oh, dear, said Dinah, and sat down suddenly on the dusty floor. My legs won't hold me up any more. I suppose the men would never have let Lucy Ann and me out of the hidden room unless they discovered our way in and made it impossible for us to escape that way. Do stop sniffing, Lucy Ann. It doesn't do any good. Don't bother her, said Jack, 
who felt sorry for his small sister. You girls, go down to the hall and see if that room is still shut. If it is, I'll slip down and go up the crag to my gorse bush. You can sit about the rocks there and whisper to me what goes on. I wish we knew where Button got in and out, said Lucy Ann. If we did, we might try his way. Only I suppose if it's a rabbit hole, it would be far too narrow for us. They made their way to the hall. The stone was still in place over the hidden room. They beckoned Jack down, and he sped across the hall, out of the great doorway, across the courtyard, and up the craggy, gorse-grown rock in the corner to the safety of his hiding place. He crawled in, and the bush closed around him. The girls climbed up the rocks to be near him. They undid a packet of food and began to have a meal, though Lucy Ann choked over almost every mouthful. They handed Jack some food through the prickly branches of the bush. Shh! Here are two of the men, said Dinah. Don't say a word more, Jack. The men gave a loud shout for the two girls. Dinah answered sulkily. They beckoned to them to come down from the crag. And did you find your little plank? inquired the bearded man politely, and the other man sniggered. No, you took it away, said Dinah sullenly. Of course, it was such a good idea of yours, but we didn't like it, said the man. Now you cannot get away, you know that, so you may stay here unharmed in the courtyard, and at night you may sleep peacefully in the big bed downstairs, for we have work to do that will take us elsewhere. But we forbid you to go up to the towers or upstairs at all. We are not going to have you signaling for help. You understand that if you disobey us, you will be very sorry, and you will probably be put down into a dungeon we know of, where rats and mice and beetles live. Dinah shuddered. The men walked off and disappeared once more into the castle. What's happening to Philip? said Lucy Anne, after a pause. Will he starve down there? I wish we could rescue him. He won't starve. There's plenty of food on the table. If only he can step off his pedestal and get it, said Dinah. If only we could send word to Tassie. She might get help. But there's no way of sending word. The sun sank lower. Long shadows lay across the courtyard, and then the whole of it went into twilight. The men came up the yard, two of them together. They called the girls. Hey, you two girls, you better come down and go to bed. We don't mind the dark, we'll stay a bit longer, shouted back Dinah. Well, come down in half an hour, shouted the bearded man. It will be quite dark then, and you'd be better inside. They disappeared. Dinah slipped down from her perch and went silently after them. She saw them going down the steps of the hidden room. Then she heard the now familiar grating noise as the entrance hole was closed by the sliding stone. She ran back to Jack. Come on, Jack, she whispered. The men are down in the hidden room. You'll be safe if you come out. Very glad to come from his uncomfortable hiding place, Jack squeezed out of the bush. Golly, I'm stiff, he said. Come on, let's go for a nice sharp walk round the courtyard. They set off linking their arms together. They hadn't gone more than halfway before something hurled itself against them out of the shadows and almost knocked Jack over. He stopped, startled. It's Button! Dear little old Button, how did you get here? Oh, I am glad to see you. Button made happy noises in his throat, rolled over like a puppy, licked the girls and Jack, and generally behaved as if he was mad with delight but he kept going off to the side and back again, and it was soon clear to the others that he had come to find Philip, his master. Mm, you can't get to Philip, old boy, said Jack, fondling the little fox cub. You'll have to make do with us. Philip isn't here. Jack, I've got an idea, said Lucy Ann, suddenly clutching her brother's arm. What? said Jack, who never thought very much of Lucy Ann's good ideas. Can't we use Button as a messenger? Can't we send him back to Tassie with a note, telling her to get help for us? Button's sure to go back to her when he can't find Philip, because next to Philip he loves Tassie. Can't we do that? Jack considered it. Well, he said, I must say it seems worth trying. All right, we'll make Button our messenger. The next thing 
was to write a note to Tassie. Jack had a notebook, and he tore out a page. He wrote a few words in pencil and read them out to the others. Tassie, we are imprisoned here. Get help as soon as you can. We may be in serious danger. They all signed it. Then Jack folded it up and wondered how to get Button to take it. He thought of a way at last. He had some string in his pocket, and first of all he tied the note tightly round and round with it. Then he twisted the string fairly tightly round Button's sturdy little neck. There, said Jack, pleased. I don't think Button can get that off. Go back to Tassie, Button, said Lucy Ann. But Button didn't understand. He still hoped Philip would appear, and he didn't want to go back until he'd seen him, or better still, he would stay with him if he could. So the little fox cub hunted all around for Philip again and again, occasionally stopping and trying to get off this new thing round his neck. But he couldn't. Suddenly one of the men called loudly, making everyone jump violently. Come in, you two girls. Good night, Jack. We must go, whispered Lucy Ann, giving her brother a hug. Good night. Don't worry about anything. Once Button gets to Tassie, she'll soon bring help. The girls left him in the dark courtyard. They went into the hall and saw the dim light of the lamp shining up from the hidden room. They went down the stone steps and looked hurriedly round. Was Philip still in the suit of armour? They couldn't tell. All the suits of armour were standing around as usual, but whether one had Philip inside or not, they didn't know. We are going to shut you in here, said the shaggy man. You can use that bed to sleep in. We shall see you in the morning. He went up the steps and then the stone swung sideways and upwards, closing the hole completely. The girls were prisoners once again. They stood in silence for a moment or two, listening. Philip, whispered Lucy Ann, looking at the suit of armour in which she'd last seen him. Are you there? Speak to us. I'm still here, came Philip's voice, sounding queerly hollow. But I hope I never have to spend another day like this. I'm going to get out of this harbour. I've got cramp in all my limbs. I'm tired out with standing so still, and I've had to stop myself sneezing at least three times. It's been a most awful strain, I can tell you. A clanking noise came from the suit of armour as Philip began to get out of it, clumsily and awkwardly, for he felt very stiff. Oh, poor old Philip, said Lucy Ann, going to help. You must have had an awful day. I have, but I wouldn't really have missed it for worlds, said Philip. My word, I've learnt a few things, I can tell you. We'd better get on the bed in case those awful men come back, said Dinah. What will you do if they do, Philip? I shall hear the grating noise the stone makes when it moves, and I'll hop out of bed and get underneath it, said Philip. There was plenty of room for them all on the enormous old bed. There was an eider-down mattress which the three children sank into. Philip was pleased. After the hardness of the suit of armour, it was pleasant to feel something so soft. He sat up and told his story. Well, you remember when you went up the steps by yourselves and left me there, he said. I was awfully angry to think those men should talk to you like that, but I couldn't do anything about it, of course. Anyway, I just stayed put for ages, and after some time, all three men came down, shut up the entrance hole, and sat around the table. Could you understand their talk? asked Lucy Ann. No, more's the pity I couldn't, said Philip. They had maps out and were tracing things on them, but I couldn't see what. I almost overbalanced myself trying to see. Gracious, what a shock it would give them those men if you had toppled over with a crash, said Dinah with a laugh. Good thing you didn't, though. You see the tapestry over there, the one with the dogs and the horses on it, said Philip, pointing. Exactly opposite where my suit of armour stands. Well, behind there is a secret door. He paused, and the girls gazed first at the tapestry. And then at Philip. Shall we see where that door leads to? said Dinah, overcome with curiosity. No, don't let's, said Lucy Ann, who'd had enough excitement for one day. You're scared, said Dinah, scornfully. No, she's not, said Philip. Anyway, I think it would be a mistake to mess about behind that tapestry just now. If the men happened to come back and saw that we'd found their secret door, goodness knows what they'd do. We might never be heard of again. 
Dinah began to tell Philip about their day with Jack in the courtyard, and all that had happened. He was very glad that Jack hadn't been caught. Well, that's two people those men have no idea are here, he said. Me and Jack. That's good. As long as they think it's only a couple of girls they've got to deal with, they won't be so much on their guard. Then Dinah told him about sending Button with a message to Tassie. He listened thoughtfully, and then made a remark that sent their hearts down into their boots. It was a fine idea, he said, but it won't do a bit of good, I'm afraid. You've forgotten that Tassie can't read or write. Jack felt lonely when the girls had gone down the steps to the hidden room for the night. He was left up in the courtyard with Kiki, and he felt bored. Then suddenly he saw the three men standing in the moonlight, and felt glad that he had not been wandering about, for he would certainly have been seen. He slipped away into the shadows of the great wall, and came near to the enormous door that stood facing what had once been the road to the castle. He sat down by a big bush, knowing it would hide him completely. Suddenly he jumped violently, and stared as if he could not believe his eyes. The big door was opening. It swung slowly back without a sound. Two men entered the castle yard, and then the great solid door closed silently behind them. There was a loud click, and then the two men passed quite close to Jack and joined the other three. Then they all disappeared into the castle. Jack imagined they were going down to the hidden room, as indeed they were. He waited till they'd gone and then made his way as quickly as he could to the big door in the high wall. If only he could open it, if only he could get out and go down the hillside, even if he had to walk over the treacherous landslide. He felt about for the handle of the door. It was a large iron ring. Jack twisted it this way and that, but the door didn't open. He sat and brooded near the door. I'll wait here in the shadows till they come back, and then I'll dash out with them. They'll be so taken by surprise that maybe they won't even put out a hand to me. So Jack sat there, hour after hour, almost falling asleep. But the men did not return. When the eastern sky began to turn silver, Jack knew it was time to return to his gorse bush. The girls came out of the hidden room at about eight o'clock. The three men had gone down there and turned them out. Dinah begged Philip to get back into the suit of armour before the men returned, but he wouldn't. No, I'd rather be under the bed, he said firmly. One day in that horrible stiff suit is enough for me. I'd rather be caught than stand there all day again. You put me some food and drink under the bed and I'll stay here. I can always wander about and stretch my legs when the men aren't here. Apparently it was the men's intention to sleep the day away on the big four-poster. They came down into the room and ordered the girls out. We'll call you down tonight, said the bearded man from the bed, and he yawned. Take what food you want from that pile of tins. There's a tin opener on the table now. Clear out and leave us. Couple of little nuisances. The girls grabbed a tin of sardines, a tin of salmon, one of peaches and one of apricots, and fled up the stairs. Sleep well, said Dinah mockingly. And then the two girls went in search of Jack. He was under his gorse bush, wishing they would come. Jack, you all right? You can come out for a bit because the men are safe down in the underground room, said Lucy Ann. You want some sardines or peaches? We got both. Hello, said Jack, delighted to see them. I'm longing for something to eat. Didn't you bring some biscuits with you when you came yesterday? Dinah found the tin of biscuits, and they had a comic breakfast of sardines, biscuits and peaches washed down by ginger beer. Still, they all enjoyed it thoroughly and exchanged their news eagerly. Jack was intensely interested to hear all that Philip had told them. A secret way behind that tapestry, he exclaimed, his eyes gleaming. But where does it lead to? Goodness knows. Into the hillside somewhere, I suppose, said Dinah, dipping a biscuit into peach juice and sucking it. The day passed slowly. There was nothing to do, not even an eagle to watch. Wish I could do a spot of developing, sighed Jack, feeling in his shorts pocket for his precious rolls of film. But I can't. I'm just longing to see how the eagles have come out. The day passed at last, and night came. The men yelled for the two girls to go down into the secret room again. 
they said a hurry good night to Jack and went. Jack did not hide in his gorse bush. When it was dark enough, he went down to the spring near the bottom of the wall to get a drink. He bent down to the spring and then listened in amazement. A most curious noise was coming from the little tunnel into which it disappeared. A scraping, dragging noise could be heard too. Something was coming up the tunnel. Jack stepped back in great alarm. Then he heard the unmistakable sound of Button yelping and he knew that part of the noise must be made by the fox cub. He bent over the tunnel and flashed his torch on to see down the narrow mouth. He saw a white face staring up at him. It was Tassie's. She was lying still for the moment, but began to wriggle again when the light flashed on her. Tassie, what are you doing? Tassie, said Jack, in a low but most astonished voice. Tassie didn't answer. She squeezed herself up a bit more until her head and shoulders were outside the tunnel. Then Jack gave her a pull and she came out at once. Button followed, looking very forlorn. Tassie had him on a lead and he couldn't get away. Tassie sat down and gasped painfully. She put her head over her knees which were drawn up and seemed quite unable to speak a word. Jack flashed his torch over her. She was soaking wet and unspeakably dirty. Mud streaked her face and arms and legs. She was shivering with cold and fright. Jack made her get up and go with him to the crag. He put her behind a rock and fetched the rugs. He made her strip off the soaked dress she wore and cover herself from head to foot with a couple of rugs. Then the boy sat close to her to warm her. Kiki perched on her shoulder and pressed against her cold cheek. Soon Tassie's breath grew more even and she turned to look at Jack, trying to summon up a faint smile. "'Where's Philip?' she whispered at last. "'With the girls,' said Jack, not wanting to tell her everything at once. "'Don't worry for a minute or two. Get your breath back. You're exhausted.' Eventually she managed to explain to Jack that Button had brought the note, but she couldn't read it. So she had the idea of putting a dog lead on Button and trailing round with him. She thought he might try to find Philip again. It worked. He led her up a sort of tunnel that the spring flows through. It was very narrow. She nearly got stuck. Could you wriggle down the tunnel with me and we'll fetch help? said Tassie. That's just what I thought of doing, said Jack. I think I'd better go tonight, Tassie, and not wait to take the two girls. You'd better stay here and tell the girls what has happened. You can hide in my old gorse bush till they come tomorrow morning. Tassie sighed with relief. She didn't in the least want to go back down that terrible way again. She would dream about it all her life long. Neither did she really want to stay in the courtyard alone for the night, but Jack said he would leave both Kiki and Button with her, and they could sleep in the gorse bush altogether. Jack crawled head first into the cold water. He wriggled into the tunnel. It smelt damp and nasty. He dragged his body down using hands and elbows to lever himself along. It wasn't at all pleasant. When he got down some way, the rather earthy tunnel gave way to hard rock. Jack thought he must be under the wall by now. The tunnel widened out considerably, and the boy sat on a ledge to rest. He began to shiver with the cold, for he was now soaked through. He went on again. It was quite dark and he could only feel his way along. It seemed hours before he reached the outlet, but at last he was there. He dragged himself out and sat panting on a patch of soft heather. He hoped that never in his life again would he have to crawl through a tunnel like that. He set off down the hill, looking eagerly for a sight of Spring Cottage. Yes, there it was, black, with the moonlight behind it, its roof silvered and shining. And then suddenly Jack stopped. He had seen something that struck him as odd. There's smoke. Smoke coming from the chimney, he said to himself. And he leaned against a tree. What does that mean? Can Aunt Allie be back? Well, no, Tassie would have known. He crept near to the cottage. There was a light shining out of one of the windows. Jack tiptoed to the window, anxious and puzzled. He looked cautiously in. Someone was sitting in a tall-backed armchair 
that had its back to Jack. Was it Mrs. Mannering? A cloud of smoke suddenly came from the chair. Thick, blue, pipe smoke. It's a man, whispered Jack to himself. Whoever can it be? He made up his mind to creep into the house and peep through the crack in the kitchen door. He stole round to the other side of the house where his bedroom window was. If it was open, Jack knew he could climb the tree nearby and slip inside. It was open. Just a crack. He went to the tree and climbed it quickly. He slipped his hand inside the crack of the window and jiggled the catch. It dropped and the window swung open. Jack cautiously climbed inside and stood there, hardly daring to breathe. He made his way to the rather creaky, winding stairs. Then he began to go down, one step at a time, hoping to goodness they wouldn't creak too loudly. There was a bend in one place, and Jack meant to stand there quietly before he went on, but no sooner had he got there than someone leapt on him, caught his arms, and jerked him violently down the last four stairs. He fell, and all the breath was bumped out of his body. Whoever had jumped on him stood up and then pulled him roughly to his feet. Then he was propelled swiftly into the lighted kitchen. Jack turned to face his captor, fully expecting to see one of the men from the tower. The two stared at one another in the very greatest surprise and stepped backwards in amazement. Bill Smugs! Jack! What on earth are you doing creeping in like this? I thought you must be a burglar. Golly! You bruised me properly, said Jack, rubbing himself. He began to shiver violently again. Bill looked at his soaking clothes and pale face and pulled him to the fire, on which a kettle was boiling merrily. What have you been up to? You're dripping wet. You'll get a frightful chill. Look, where are the others? When I arrived today to ask Mrs. Mannering if she could put me up for a night or two, the house was shut. There was no one here. Well, how did you get in, then? asked Jack, enjoying the warmth of the fire. Oh, I have my ways, said Bill. I thought you must have all gone picnicking, so I waited and waited for you to come back, but you didn't. So I decided to spend the night here by myself and make inquiries somewhere tomorrow to see what had happened to you all. And then I heard mysterious sounds, decided it was a burglar, and caught you. Bill made a jug of hot cocoa and milk, found some biscuits, and gave them to Jack, who was now feeling a lot warmer. He'd stripped off his wet things and was sitting in a dressing gown. I don't feel I ought to waste time like this, really, he said, as the others are in danger, but I'll have to tell you the whole story and then leave it to you what to do. Go ahead, said Bill. So Jack began, and Bill listened with the greatest interest. This is an extraordinary tale, Jack he said at last. There's a lot more in this than you know. What were those men like? Describe them. Was there a man there with a scar right across his chin and neck? Um, no, said Jack, thinking. Not one of them, as far as I know. I took a jolly good snap of one man, though, when they were at the eagle's nest. Have you got those snaps? said Bill, eagerly. I got the films, said Jack, and he pointed to the tightly rolled up sou'wester on the table. They're in there. They're not developed yet, Bill. Well, whilst you have a good sleep, I'll develop them, said Bill. I see you've got a little dark room fixed up for yourself off the hall there. Yeah, but oughtn't we to go right back and rescue the girls? asked Jack. Well, I shall have to collect a few men and arrange a few things. If these men are doing what I think they are, then we stand a good chance of roping them all in together. I don't think they'll harm the girls at all. What are the men doing? asked Jack curiously. Are they anything to do with the job you said you were on, Bill? Hmm, <laughs> can't tell you yet, said Bill. I hardly think so, but I shall soon know. He put Jack on the sofa, arranged rugs over him, turned down the lamp, and went off into the little dark room with the films. 
Jack slept peacefully, for he was tired out. How long he slept, he didn't know, but he was awakened by Bill coming into the room in the greatest excitement, holding a film. <laughs> Sorry to wake you, Jack, but this is a marvellous thing, he said. And he held the film up to the daylight, which was now coming in at the window. You have snapped this man perfectly. Every detail is as clear as could be. He's the man with the beard. Who is he? asked Jack curiously. His name, his real name, is Mannheim, said Bill. But he's known as Skarnick. He is a very dangerous spy. Golly, said Jack, staring. Were you after him? Well, I was detailed to keep an eye on him and watch his movements, said Bill. I wasn't to capture him because we wanted to know what he was up to this time and who his friends were. Then we hoped to rope in the whole lot. But Skarnick is a very clever fellow with an absolute gift for disappearing. <laughs> I traced him to the town where you met me, and uh, then I lost him completely. Now I'm off in the car to the town to do a little reporting on the telephone there and to collect a few friends. You go to sleep again. You'll be able to go up to the castle with me when I come back and show me the way. Jack slept peacefully again for some hours. He didn't wake until Bill returned in the car. With him were four friends. Jack thought they looked pretty tough. It was plain that Bill was in authority over them. Bill came into the kitchen, leaving the men outside. Hello, he said. Wake at last. <laughs> it's gone one o'clock. Uh, are we going up to the castle soon, said Jack, gathering the dressing gown round him and preparing to go upstairs to his bedroom. No, not till tonight, said Bill. We plan to go just before midnight. I've no doubt one or other of those men keep a lookout during the daytime. Oh, the girls will be awfully tired of waiting for us all day long, said Jack. Can't very well help it, said Bill. It is most important that we get in without being seen. Jack went up and dressed. It was terribly hot, though the sun was behind sulky-looking clouds. He felt out of breath, though he'd done nothing at all. Feels like a storm, he thought. I hope it won't come today. It might frighten the girls, up there, all alone. Just as it got dark, they all piled into Bill's big car and set off up the hill. The car seemed to make rather a noise, Jack thought, but Bill assured him it wouldn't be heard at the castle. The only thing that worries me a bit is having Philip down in that hidden room, said Bill. If there's a rough house down there, and I rather think there may be, I don't want kids mixed up in it. Well, really, Bill, it was us kids who got you mixed up in this adventure, said Jack, most indignantly. <laughs> yes, I know, said Bill with a laugh, but it, it rather cramps our style to have you around just now. Bill, what are you going to do? asked Jack with curiosity. I want to find out where that secret door leads to, said Bill. I think I know, but I, I want to make sure, and I want to learn a few things without those men at the castle knowing it. It was a pity they spoke in a language Philip couldn't understand, or he might have learnt what we want to know. Well, how are you going to learn it, then? asked Jack. Same way as Philip might have, said Bill, with a laugh. Put myself and the men into those suits of armour, and listen into the conversation. Gosh, said Jack, thrilled. I never thought of that. Oh, Bill, do you really think you can do that? Can Philip and I hide, too? Well, we'll see, said Bill. Now... Here we are at the landslide, surely. They were. They all had to get out, and Jack now had to lead the way. He found the narrow rabbit path they'd so often used and led the men along it. They all walked in dead silence, in obedience to an order from Bill, and at last came to the great castle wall. Jack stopped. Here's the castle wall, he whispered. How are you going to get into the castle, Bill? Where's that other door you told me of? Not the big front door that overlooks the landslide, the other, smaller door, somewhere in the wall of the castle, asked Bill. I'll take you to it, but I told you it was locked, said Jack. He led Bill and the others round the wall, turned a corner, and came to the door. Bill took out his torch and flashed it quickly up and down the door, coming to a stop at the lock. One of the men came up with a curious thing in his hand, rather like a small can with a thick spout. Jack stared at it, wondering what it was. You'll have to get to work on it, Jim, said Bill. Go ahead. Make as little noise as possible. Stop if I nudge you. 
A sizzling noise came from the can, and a jet of strong blue flame shot out from the spout, making Jack jump. The man pointed the spout of flame at the door, just above the lock. Now to go in, said Bill, as he swung the door slowly open. Everyone ready? They filed in silently. The last man shut the door and wedged in a bit of wood by the lock to keep it from swinging. I'll just go and see if Tassie's under my gorse bush, whispered Jack. We'll have to find out the latest news from her. The men waited in the shadows with Bill, whilst Jack went over to the crag. He climbed up to the gorse bush. A loud voice hailed him. Ah, put the kettle on! How many times? I... Shut up, Kiki! whispered Jack in a panic. Tassie crawled out of the bush, full of joy, for she'd been feeling very frightened and lonely. Oh, Jack, did you come up the awful watery tunnel like I did? Did you get help? Yes, Bill Smugs is here with some of his men, whispered Jack. You and the other two girls must go down to Spring Cottage. Come on, we must go over to Bill. The moon struggled out as the two went over to the little group of silent men. Bill put a few questions to Tassie, and she answered them shyly. It rather looked as if the men were down in the secret room. Well, they would get a shot when the stone swung back, and they saw who were at the top of the steps. Now listen, said Bill. You are to work the lever that opens the entrance to the secret room, Jack. As soon as the entrance is open, I and the others will stand at the top and shout down to the men below to come up. We shall have them covered with our revolvers. <gasps> Golly, said Jack. Look out for the girls, Bill. They may be scared stiff. I can yell to them to keep out of the way, said Bill. We'll have them up the steps in no time, and you, Tessie, must take them straight away down the hill to Spring Cottage. Quietly, they all moved forward towards the great black hulk of the castle. They stepped silently into the hall. Jack slipped quietly to the back of the hall with one of the men. Tassie showed Bill the entrance to the underground room. He and the others waited there whilst Jack pulled back the spike in the wall. A grating noise was heard, and once again the stone swung back and then sideways. A yawning hole appeared with stone steps leading downwards. The light from the lamp shone upwards. Bill stood at the top of the hole, listening intently. There was no sound at all from below. Jack tiptoed up to him. Maybe there are only the girls and Philip there, he whispered. Perhaps the men have gone off somewhere, down the secret way behind the tapestry. Bill nodded. He sent his voice rumbling down the hole. Who's down there? Answer! A small voice came back. It was Dinah's. Only us? Who's that? Dinah, it's me and Bill Smugs, called Jack before Bill could stop him. Are you alone? Yes, came back Dinah's voice, lifted in excitement. Is Bill there? Oh, good! Jack ran down the steps and Bill and the others followed, one man being left at the top on guard. Lucy Ann flew to Jack and hugged him tightly, tears pouring down her face. No time to waste, said Bill. Where's Philip? Oh, Bill, he's gone, said Lucy Ann. We don't know if the men caught him or, or if Philip went off by himself or what. We think maybe he explored that secret way under the tapestry. Bill, the men are coming back soon, said Dinah, suddenly remembering. I heard one of them say to another in English that they were to have their last meeting here tonight. I'm beginning to see daylight, said Bill grimly. Now look here, Dinah. You and Lucy Ann are to go with Tassie straight away down the hill to Spring Cottage, and you are to stay there till we come. You can go out of that side door in the wall, which is now open. The man I've left upstairs will take you there safely and see you out. Then you must go at once. Dinah, Lucy Ann, and Tassie went obediently up the steps and out of the entrance hole. The man at the top went off to the door in the wall with them and saw them safely out onto the hillside. The girls disappeared into the night. The man returned to his post. The entrance to the secret room was now closed. Below, Bill, Jack and the others were hurriedly getting into the suits of armour. Bill meant to attend the next meeting of Scarneck with his men, and Jack was glad to see that they all had revolvers. 
Jack was made to stand in the suit of armor right at the back of the hidden room in case, as Bill said, there was a rough house. The boy was shaking with excitement. Kiki was not down in the room. Tassie had carried her firmly up the stone steps, screeching with annoyance at being parted from Jack so soon again. But Button, the fox cub, was there. Nobody knew it, of course. The fox cub had curled himself up under the bed where Philip had hidden, glad to smell the familiar smell of the master he loved. Soon, all the suits of armour were standing once more on their pedestals round the curious, museum-like room. Now, silence, said Bill. Not a word from anyone. I think I heard something. But it was not anyone. It was a peal of thunder so loud that the noise had penetrated even down to the underground room. I hope the girls won't be frightened, said Bill, thinking of them scurrying down the hillside in the darkness. I wonder if it's raining. They'll be all right with Tassie, I think, said Jack. There was dead silence once more. Then, suddenly, sounding quite loud, there came the noise of a door being unlocked. Then the tapestry on one wall shook, and someone lifted it up from behind. A man came out from behind the tapestry and folded it back. Jack saw an opening behind, leading into the wall. From it came soft-footed men, one after the other, and with them they brought Philip. The shaggy-browed man came first. Then the bearded man, the one called Skarnik, dragging Philip. Philip was putting on a bold face, but Jack knew he was feeling scared. After him came three more men, all ugly fellows with sharp eyes and stern mouths. They came into the room, talking. They left the secret way open. Philip's hands were bound behind his back so tightly that the rope bit into his skin. Skarnik flung him into a chair. It was soon clear that Philip had only just been captured. Skarnik rounded on him almost at once. How long have you been in the castle? What do you know? I was here with the girls, said Philip. I hid under the bed. I wasn't doing any harm. We only came to play about in this old castle. We didn't know it belonged to anyone. Get the girls, growled Skarnek to the shaggy man. The shaggy-browed man went over to the bed and pulled back the curtain. They are not here, he said in an astonished voice. Skarnek spoke roughly to Philip. Did you let them out? No, said Philip, I didn't. I was hiding here, I tell you, under the bed. I wasn't at the top. Well, who let them out then, said the shaggy man. Now you tell us everything, said Skarnek and his voice was suddenly ugly and threatening. Philip said nothing but stared defiantly at the man. Skarnek lost his temper, raised his fist, and gave Philip such a blow on the side of the head that the boy fell off his chair. He picked himself up. Now will you talk, said Skarnek, his voice growing with rage. Still Philip said nothing. Jack felt proud. How brave he was. Then, to his horror, the man took out a revolver and laid it on the table beside him. We have ways of making sulky boys talk, he said, and his eyes gleamed with rage. What would have happened next if there hadn't been a sudden and surprising interruption? Nobody knew. But all at once, like a stone from a catapult, Button, who had slunk under a chair on the far side of the room when the men arrived, shot out and threw himself on Philip. Skarnik caught up his revolver. He lashed out at the cub and sent him rolling to the ground. Button bared his small white teeth. Don't hurt him, said Philip in alarm. He's only a cub. He's mine. How did he get down here? And the girls got out, I suppose, growled the shaggy man. I don't know, said Philip, puzzled. I tell you, I really don't know how the girls got out, nor how the cub got in. It's as much a mystery to me as to you. If this kid is telling the truth, we'd better finish up and get going, said the shaggy man, sounding rather anxious. Let's settle up our business and go. A rumble of thunder came down into the secret room again. The men looked at one another uneasily. <gasps> What's that? asked the shaggy man. Thunder, of course growled Skarnik. What's the matter with you? Getting nervy just because a bunch of silly kids are playing around? 
What they want is a good beating, and I'll see this boy gets it before we go. Skarnik nodded to one of the others, and he went to the drawer where the documents were kept, unlocked it, and drew out the sheaf of papers there. He put them in front of Skarnik. Then began a long discussion in a language that Philip did not understand. But Bill understood it. Bill could speak eight or more different languages, and he listened eagerly to all that was said. Philip sat listlessly on his chair, his wrists hurting him, and his left ear now twice its size. He wished he was standing safely inside the suit of armour he'd hidden in before. He glanced round at it, and then stared in the utmost amazement. Surely eyes were gleaming behind that visor. He glanced at the next suit of armour, and saw what he imagined were eyes there too, and the next one. He felt terribly scared. Had all these suits of armour come alive all of a sudden? Then he began to think clearly, and it was soon plain to him that it must be friends inside the armour, and not enemies. Bill was listening intently to all that was being said. Papers were spread out on the table, and Bill could not see what they were. They looked like blueprints of some sort, details of machinery, perhaps. Skarnek rolled them up at last. Then he turned to Philip. Well, our job is done. We shall not have the pleasure of seeing you or your friends any more, but before we go, we shall teach you what it means to spy on us. Where's that rope? Don't you dare touch me, cried Philip, jumping to his feet. Skarnek took the rope. Then, to his unutterable horror, one of the suits of armour walked off its pedestal, held up a stiff and clanking arm, at the end of which shone a wicked-looking revolver, and said, The game's up, Skarnek. We've got you all. The voice sounded hollow. Skarnek and the others stared in the utmost dismay, and then looked round at the other suits of armour, which were also coming alive. It seemed like a bad dream, but a dream that had too many revolvers in it. Hands up, said Bill's sharp voice. Skarnek began to put his hands up, but suddenly he turned, took hold of the oil lamp, and smashed it on the ground. In a moment, the room was pitch dark. Bill gave a cry of rage. Then Jack heard his voice. Get under the bed, Jack and Philip, quick! They may be shooting! The boys did exactly as they were told. They dived for the bed, Jack clanking in his armour. Philip lay there panting, wishing his hands were not tied. Jack got stuck halfway under the bed. What was happening in the room they didn't know. There were shouts and pantings and groans, but nobody did any shooting. It was too dark to risk that in case friend shot friend. Suddenly there was a grating noise, and the boys knew the entrance above was being opened. But who was opening it, their side or the other? Philip had no idea how it was opened from below, though he had often tried to find out, for obviously there must be a way. Then he knew that Skarnek or one of his friends must have opened it as a way of escape, for he heard Bill's voice shouting up to the man he'd left above, Tom, look out! Shoot anybody coming up! Down below, things were going badly for the three men left. One of them was completely knocked out. Another had given in because Bill had sat on top of him so firmly that there wasn't anything else to do. And the third man had tried to escape down the secret way behind the tapestry, but was now being forcibly brought back. Bill at last found a torch and switched it on. The oil lamp was smashed beyond repair. By the light of the powerful torch, Bill had a look round. The man he'd been sitting on was now in the charge of someone else, and was looking extremely sorry for himself. The two boys came out from under the bed. Bill had to tug at Jack to set him free. Jack got out of the hot armour as quickly as he could, and freed Philip's hands. Bill's face wore a look of utter disgust. He could see that the two men he most wanted to catch, Skarnek and the shaggy-browed man, were gone. He called up to Tom. Are you there, Tom? Yes, sir, came back Tom's voice, rather subdued. Have you got the two who came up the steps? shouted Bill. No, sir. Sorry to say they bowled me over and got away, sir, replied Tom, even more subdued. Bill muttered a few rude names for the unlucky Tom. Tie up these fellas, said Bill, curtly nodding to their captives. They began to do it very efficiently, and soon the men sat like trussed fowls, sullen and tousled, frowning into space. 
Now we'll have a look at those papers, said Bill. Yes, yes, they've got everything here they wanted to know, he said. That fellow Scarneck is about the cleverest spy in any country. I bet he felt mad to leave these behind. They're worth a fortune to him. One of the men rolled them up. As he did so, a terrific roll of thunder echoed all around. Everyone looked startled. Storm's about overhead, I should think, said Bill. I don't think we'll venture down the hillside ourselves till it's over. Aren't you going to see where that secret way leads to? asked Jack in disappointment. Oh, yes, said Bill. Tom and I'll go whilst the others take the prisoners down the hill, but we'll wait till daylight now, I think. The thunder was now so noisy and continuous that it was no use talking. I'm just going to have a squint out of the front door, said Bill. It must be a fine sight, this storm. We'll come too, said the boys. So up the stone steps they went and down the hall to the open front door of the castle. They stopped in awe just before they got there. The whole countryside lay cowering under the worst storm they'd ever seen. And the rain! It poured down as if great rivers had been let loose from the sky. It's a cloudburst, said Bill. The sky has opened and let down a deluge. <laughs> I should think Scarneck and the other fella are having a pretty bad time of it out on the hillside. Anyway, the girls had plenty of time to get down to Spring Cottage, said Jack. As Jack was speaking, there came the most tremendous clap of thunder he was ever to hear in his life. Bill suddenly pulled them back a little. I think the castle has been struck, he said. Yes, it has. Look! One of the towers, lit up by the next flash, was seen by the two boys to be in the act of falling. Bill hustled the boys back to the steps that led to the hidden room. Down they went, and then paused in awe, for now it seemed as if the castle itself was falling. Hurriedly, Bill pulled at the spike that shut the entrance. With relief, he saw the stone slide sideways and upwards, and the entrance was closed. Almost immediately, there came a terrific sound of falling stone, crashing onto stone below, and the room shook. The castle's falling in on top of us, cried Philip, and he went pale. Bill thought part of it must have been struck again by lightning and have fallen inwards. You know... I've just realised that I'm awfully hungry, said Philip suddenly. I've had nothing to eat since I went off by myself to explore that secret passage. Oh, you must be famished, said Bill. There seems to be a nice pile of tins over there. I think it might while away the time and make us forget this awful storm if we attacked the contents. Jack and Philip examined the tins. They chose one tin of spiced meat, one tin of tongue and two of peaches. Everyone felt better after the meal. The storm seemed to be dying down. Bill glanced at his watch. Half past five, he said with a yawn. I'm dying for a breath of air, said Philip, whose face was bright scarlet with heat. How do you open the entrance from down here, Bill? Up there by the ceiling, said Bill, and showed Philip how. There was a hidden lever there. He pulled at it, but it didn't move. It won't budge, said Bill, surprised. Then both Bill and Tom tried together. The stone moved an inch or two and then stopped. Bill went up the steps as far as he could and tried to peer through the crack. I'm afraid part of the castle has fallen in on top of the entrance, he said. We can't get out. We'll have to use the other way then, the passage I went down yesterday, said Philip. Yes, said Bill. I only hope that hasn't done any slipping and sliding, too. Come on, we'll try our luck this way. I'll go first. He went into the hole in the wall and pushed at the door there. It opened. Bill went through, shining his torch in front of him. The two boys followed. Then came the three men with their captives, who were now very subdued indeed. The passage was narrow, but fairly straight at first. After a while, the stone of the tunnel walls turned to solid rock, uneven of surface. The air was surprisingly fresh. Bill thought part of the passage was artificial and part natural. It was plain that it went straight through the top of the hill in a downward direction. And then suddenly they heard the noise of water. They stopped. Bill looked back at Philip. Water, he said. Did you see any before when you came down here? Philip shook his head. No, he said. 
It was all quite dry. They went on, puzzled, and suddenly they saw what made the noise. The deluge of rain soaking down into the hillside was trying to get away somewhere and was running down in a torrent underground. Goodness, said Jack, peering over Bill's shoulder and seeing the rushing water by the light of his torch. We can't go down there now. It's not very deep, said Bill, looking at it. I believe we should be able to wade along all right. He put his foot into it and found that it was about knee-deep. They all waded into the torrent. Splashing through the water, they went on their way again. It was slow going. Jack, who was getting very tired, thought it would never come to an end. All at once, the passage began to slope down very steeply indeed, so steeply that the torrent made quite a waterfall. Bill stopped. Well, I don't see how we can get down there, he said. Oh, but wait a minute. I believe there are stone steps leading downwards. Yes, there are. We should be all right if we don't let the water rush us off our feet. He went first, very cautiously, feeling for the steps with his feet. The boys followed equally cautiously, Jack almost being rushed off his feet once or twice by the surging fall of water. Suddenly, Bill put his torch out and daylight appeared in front. The stone steps led out to the opposite side of the castle hill. They were there at last. Bill leapt out of the water and came out of a narrow opening in the hillside, almost completely covered by brambles. <laughs> well, here we are, he said, safe after all. The boys came out of the hole too and they all stared at the sight below them. They were on a very steep hillside with an almost sheer drop beneath. Directly below was what looked like a farmhouse with outbuildings on the slope of the hill. All around the place was barbed wire, row upon row of it. There was a copse of trees behind the house, and in the middle was a clear space. A curious-looking machine stood in the centre of this clearing. It was large and shining. What is it? asked Jack, gazing at it in the clear morning sunlight. Not even I know that, Jack, said Bill. It's one of our own country's secrets, something being worked on by our greatest military scientists. And that's what Scarneck the spy was after? asked Philip. That's what he was after, said Bill. He got wind of it, found out where the tests were being carried out in secret, and discovered to his delight that there was an old castle on the other side of the hill for sale. Gosh, did he buy the castle then? asked Jack. Bill nodded. Yes, I made it my business to find out who the owner was. Scarnack had not bought it in his own name. Of course, he was far too clever for that. He bought it in the name of an Englishman called Brown, a man supposed to be interested in old buildings. But I soon found out who was behind Brown. Aren't you clever, Bill, said Jack, admiringly. No, said Bill. That kind of thing is easy in my job. I knew Skarnick was probably after this secret of ours, but I couldn't for the life of me see how he could find out anything. Well, how did he get the secret then, said Philip? By wonderful photography, and by making a way right under the wire down to the machine itself, I imagine, said Bill. Look, do you see signs of digging there? Well, I imagine Skarnick and his friends did a bit of burrowing, like rabbits, right under the wire, and came up safely inside the enclosure. Wouldn't anyone see them? said Jack. Not from this side, said Bill. Nobody would guess anyone would try any tricks from up here. It would seem impossible to get here, it's so steep. And nobody knew about the passage in the castle that led right to this side of the hill, said Jack. How did he find it out? Got old plans of the castle, I expect, said Bill. The old fellow who had this castle last was quite mad. <laughs> he made all kinds of hidden rooms with curious contrivances, lived in a romantic world of his own. Skarnick found the hidden room and the secret passage a perfect godsend. It actually came out above the very secret he'd been sent to find out. He's a brave man, said Philip. Yes, most spies are brave, said Bill. But this particular one is a most unpleasant fellow, heartily disliked even in his own country. He'll double-cross anyone, not excepting his dearest friend. 
Well, I'm afraid he's got away this time, but thank goodness he's left the plans of our secret behind him in that hidden room. So he can't do any damage, I suppose, asked Philip. Not unless he remembers everything in his head, said Bill. He has a marvellous memory, of course, so maybe he will do us some damage, even now. I hope he won't, said Philip. I do so wish we'd caught him, Bill, and old Shaggy, too. I didn't like either of them at all. Everyone had been glad of the rest and fresh air, and now Bill got up and looked down the hill. How could they get down without being torn to bits by the barbed wire? Bill saw someone below. He gave a hail, and the man looked up. Who are you? he yelled. Friends, shouted back Bill. Is Colonel Yarmouth there? I know him and would like to talk to him, but I can't get through this wire. Look, said Jack suddenly, and pointed to a beautiful camera standing under a thick bramble. That's how they got their pictures. I expect that camera you gave me is ruined now, Bill. It was in the gorse bush and had no protection at all. I left it there, unfortunately. What a pity, said Bill. Well, maybe I can arrange for you to have this one instead, as a little return for letting me in on your adventure, Jack. Another man now came out into the grounds at the back of the farmhouse below. Hey, Yarmouth, yelled Bill. Don't you know me? Well, I'm blessed, floated up the Colonel's astonished voice. I'll send up a couple of men to make a way down for you. So, in a fairly short time, a way was made for them through the rows of barbed wire, which was promptly repaired again behind them. They went down to the farmhouse, slithering and almost falling down the steep descent. The Colonel and Bill disappeared into the house to talk. The others waited patiently outside. Jack and Philip lay down on the heather and yawned. After a while, the Colonel and Bill came out and snapped a few orders. Three of his men took away the captives. Well, let's get rid of them, said Bill, pleased. Now we'll get back to Spring Cottage. I'm afraid we'll have to go down to the bottom of the hill, take the road there, and then make our way up the other side to the cottage. There is apparently no other way to get there. The boys groaned. They really didn't feel like any more walking. Still, it had to be done. I suppose the adventure is over, said Philip. Quite finished. Well, there are a few loose ends to tie up, said Bill. We must just see if we can find any trace of Scarneck and his friend in any of the districts near at hand. We'll have to go and get your car too, won't we, said Jack, remembering. We left it at the beginning of the landslide. <laughs> so we did, said Bill. My word. I hope it hasn't been swept away by that deluge of rain or buried in another landslide. I want to know what's happened to the girls, too, said Philip. I'm hoping they all got back safely before the storm really started. It seems ages since I've seen them. There was a shriek from the cottage. It was Lucy Ann, of course. She came flying out of the door, her eyes shining, and flew straight at Jack. She almost bowled him over in her joy at seeing him again. Oh, Jack, you're back! And Philip, wherever did you get to? We were awfully worried about you. Dinah and Tassie came running out too, exclaiming in pleasure. Were you all right in the storm? We got so worried about you. Tassie's been up the hill, and she says half the castle has fallen down the hill. Were you all right in the storm? asked Jack, as they all went into the little house. Did you get home before the storm really broke? Well, the rain had begun, but no lightning, said Dinah. Tassie wouldn't let us rest for even a minute on the hill. She kept saying that there would be another landslide, and she was right. Good old Tassie, said Jack. She got you back just in time. I simply can't begin to tell you what it was like up in the castle. But he did tell them, of course, and they listened with their eyes wide open in horror. Where's Kiki? asked Jack, looking all around. I thought she'd be here to greet me. She keeps flying off to look for you, said Tassie. But she comes back. She won't be long, I'm sure. She wasn't. In about ten minutes' time, she was back sailing through the air, shouting loudly to Jack. She flew to his shoulder and pecked his ear lovingly. Philip put up his hand to his ear, which was still swollen. Don't you fly under my shoulder and peck my ear, he said to Kiki. It's not ready for pecking or nibbling yet. The girls got breakfast for everyone and talked nineteen to the dozen. Bill sent his three men up the road to find his car. And now, said Bill when they'd finished eating, what about a sleep, boys? 
I'm tired out. Jack was almost asleep as it was, and Philip kept yawning. So the boys went up to sleep on their beds, and Bill put himself on the couch in the kitchen. The girls went out into the garden to talk. They had to put waterproofs down on the grass because it was so wet. The day was lovely now, with not a cloud to be seen. They lazed there, chattering, with Kiki joining in now and again. Button was asleep on Philip's middle upstairs. There's someone coming, said Dinah suddenly. It's Bill's three men, said Lucy Ann lazily. The man came into the garden. They looked serious. Where's the boss? We want him, said one. He's asleep, so don't disturb him yet, said Dinah. Sorry, Missy, but I'm afraid we must disturb him, said the man. We got news. What news? asked Lucy Ann. Have you found the car? Yes, said the man. But we'll tell our news to the boss, Missy. Well, he's in the kitchen, said Dinah. The men moved off to the kitchen. They woke Bill, and the three girls heard them telling him something in urgent, serious voices. Bill came out, and the girls looked inquiringly at him. What's up, Bill? asked Dinah. Have they found your car? And is it smashed up or something? They found my car all right, said Bill slowly. And they found something else too. What? asked the three girls together. Well, apparently Scarneg and his friend went off over the landslide quite safely. And then found my car standing where we left it, said Bill. They must have got into it and turned it round. And then the deluge struck them, and another landslide began. Are they killed? asked Dinah. Well, I imagine so, said Bill. We don't know. The landslide caught the car and took it along. It dumped it upside down in a gully where these men found it, with Scarneck and the other fellow inside. Can't they get them out, then? asked Dinah. The doors are jammed, said Bill. Have you got a wire tow rope or any good strong rope that won't break? If you have, we'll take it and try and get the car the right way up. Then we may be able to open the roof and get the men out. Diana fetched some wire rope from the shed. She gave it to Bill in silence. Bill came back some hours later. The children ran to meet him. Bill was smiling. Neither of the men is dead, he said. Scarneck has concussion and is quite unconscious and rather badly hurt. The other fellow has a broken leg and was stunned too, but he's come round. So you've captured them both after all, said Philip. Well done, Bill. What about the car? asked Dinah. Well, it looks wrecked to me, said Bill, but I don't mind that. I reckon I shall be handed out a new car when my chief knows I've got Scarneck and his friend to pass over to him. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a scoop for me, though I'd never have stumbled onto their secret if it hadn't been for you children. Well, we'd have been in a pretty pickle if you hadn't turned up, said Jack. Whatever will Aunt Ally say when she comes back and hears all that has happened since she's been gone? She'll say she can't turn her back for a day or two without us all getting into mischief, said Philip, with a grin. Oh, Bill, what an adventure, said Dinah. I never dreamt we'd plunge into all this when we first came here, and it's all happened so quickly. I hope we shall have nice, peaceful holidays for the rest of the time. I've had enough adventures to last me for a year. I want to stretch my legs, said Jack. What about walking up the hillside, Bill, and having a look to see what's happened to the castle? Right, said Bill. And so they all set off up the road to the castle. But they couldn't go nearly as far as usual because the landslide had come a good deal farther down and the hillside was a terrible jumbled mass of wet rocks, heaps of soil, uprooted trees and running streams. It's horrid, said Lucy Ann. Then she turned to gaze at the frowning castle higher up. The castle looks different. Something's happened to it. Two of the towers have gone and most of the walls. The middle part of it has fallen in. It's not much more than a shell now, said Jack, staring. It looked almost a ruin. Philip stared hard at it. The middle part must have crashed down into the big hall, he said. No wonder you couldn't move that entrance stone, Bill. There must be tons of fallen boulders on top of it. Bill looked rather solemn. He could see what a narrow escape from death they'd all had. If they had been anywhere else in the castle or courtyard, 
they would have been crushed and buried. Being down in the hidden room had saved their lives. Goodbye to my camera and all our rugs and things, said Jack. I'll replace everything you've lost, promised Bill, who, now that he'd actually captured Skarnek, was ready to promise the whole world to anyone. And I'll give you all a fine present each for letting me share such a grand adventure. Me too, said Tassie at once. <laughs> you too, said Bill. What would you like, Tessie? Three pairs of shoes all for myself, said Tassie solemnly. And the others laughed. They knew Tassie wouldn't wear them. She would just keep them and love and admire them, but she would never wear them. Tassie didn't need to. Let's go back, said Lucy Ann. I don't want to look at that ruin any more. Nor do I, said Dinah. But somehow I feel as if it's better as a ruin than as a castle owned by a wicked old man or, or spies like Skarnick. I like it better now. I'm glad to think of those musty old rooms all buried away. They were horrid. Then down the hill they went in the sunshine leaving behind them the sad, broken old castle, its roof open to the wind and the rain, its proud towers fallen. <laughs> the castle of adventure, said Jack. You were right, Philip. It was the castle of adventure.